You got it, Joe. He definitely doesn't have it. No, Joe, don't charge. What the fuck? That's the 46th time and counting. This mission is impossible on insanity. How are you supposed to do anything when there's a mech, turrets, and like 100 guys coming at you from every direction? Pause. This may be a jack mission, but even the best romance in the game won't keep this mission from being trash. Sounds like a skill issue to me, Sleepy Joe. I can casually clear the Grissom Academy mission on insanity with my eyes closed. Hold on, Joe. Did you just say the Grissom Academy mission is trash? Damn right. The atrium is one of the worst designed places in the entire trilogy. Joe, there are numerous way worse missions than the Grissom Academy one. Name five worst actually essential missions. I'll do you one better. Here's a tier list with all the critical trilogy missions. You just had that on command? I always stay ready so I don't have to get ready, Donald. What do you mean by critical missions? All main story missions, missions related to recruiting and helping squad mates, and every DLC mission. It sounds like a blast. Where do we begin? Where else but the beginning? We'll call this mission Prologue, Eden Prime, where everything started. The legendary mission where Jenkins ascended to a higher plane. Amen. Amen. Eden Prime offers a solid beginning for the franchise. Starting on the Normandy, we receive an SOS from the planet, which is under attack, ending in the appearance of a strange ship that we would later recognize as Sovereign. Eden Prime is explained to be humanity's first significant foothold in space beyond the Sol system. So to see it under attack is a depressing sight. Watching the colonists be impaled by spikes and turned into husks is easily one of the darkest things to happen in the trilogy. When I reflect on this mission, it's no wonder people are unwilling to trust the Geth. And Eden Prime is the mission that introduces us to the badass and beautiful Ashley Williams, handling her business taking out the flashlight-headed robots. Shepard may save the colony, but Nilus is killed by Saren, and the beacon ends up exploding when Shepard uses it. Ha! I move faster on my own, he said. More like die faster on my own. Very clever, Donald. Eden Prime isn't very complex, but it is vital to the narrative since it begins it all. We're introduced to a squad mate, the main antagonist, the Geth and Sovereign. Plus, we get to punch out that crazy guy named Manuel. I think Prologue Eden Prime should go into B tier. Won't disagree, it's an amazing mission, but it doesn't reach the heights that others do. A great first step into Mass Effect 1, one mission I think many people overlook is Citadel, Expose Sauron. This takes place when Shepard and friends first arrive at the Citadel, and your goal is to prove to the Council that Sauron is a traitor. How nice of this mission to get us used to the Council blatantly not believing in Shepard. In this specific instance, the Council is justified. We came to them with no proof besides the account of the dock worker we met on Eden Prime. Expose Sauron is a master class in world building and pacing. We're introduced to the Council and get to see how decisions are made on a galactic scale. And this mission gives us free reign to explore the Citadel, the game's central hub. After we fail to prove Saren's guilt, we're tasked with chasing down our leads. Barlavan will lead us to Rex, or we can go speak to Harkin, who takes us to Garrus. The fact that you can choose which of these you want to do is a highlight. Mass Effect 1 allows the player to approach the quest as they wish. You can even decide not to look for Garrus or Rex after you've recruited at least one of them and follow up on going after Fist in Korra's den. Truly an example of player freedom. Going after Fist and then saving Tally from the ambush are highly unforgettable moments. I remember thinking I wouldn't have enough time to save her and finish all of Fist's men, so I just booked it out the door. Exposing Saren ends with Tali giving us her evidence, joining the squad and presenting the evidence to the Council. With Sauron proven guilty, he's stripped of all his power, and we, as a newly crowned Spectre, are sent to go take him out no matter what. The Spectre ceremony is a top moment. Listening to the Council speak about what a Spectre is supposed to be makes me forget how useless they are going forward. This mission introduces three squad mates, including the big boy Rex himself. It has great exploration, player freedom, and good firefights, and sets us up for the adventure ahead. Exposing Saren is an S-tier mission, one for the record books. It might seem a bit early to drop an S tier, but I have to agree. I feel that this is the mission that's supposed to hook you on the game. Expose Saren is a snapshot of everything you'll do in Mass Effect 1. It's an expertly designed mission. Now on the other side of the spectrum, we have Find Liara to Sony, the mission that takes place on Therum. Typically, it's recommended you do this mission right after you leave the Citadel. 
It's a shame you go from exposing Saren to this because the mission on Therum is summarized by just dropping in, picking up Liara and leaving. No real dialogue, side quests, or world building to be had. The only other memorable thing about Therum is that Krogan Battlemaster at the end of the mission. And only because that dude is a problem with insanity difficulty. I would stick this mission in C tier. It's probably one of the worst on its own. But because it introduces the blue and beautiful Liara to us, I can't put it down as far as it belongs. Let me shout out that if you wait to do this mission until after Vermeer, Liara will lose her mind and believe Shepard is a hallucination. Plus, Liara will become angry as she hears evidence of the Reapers, the Prothean Cipher, and Shepard's visions, since all her decades of research will have been for naught. A nice change in dialogue to reflect how long Liara has been trapped there, but still only a C-tier mission. Oh God, it's Pharos next. What are you two talking about? Pharos is the best mission in the game. Joe Pharos is so boring that I'd rather drive around in the empty world of Vold and Mass Effect Andromeda for five hours. I'm honestly not surprised that Sleepy Joe likes Pharos. The dull landscape of gray and brown are probably easier on his eyes, and he's probably able to relate to all the bland characters in the mission. Pharos has numerous great characters like Fidan, Arcelia, Lisbeth, uh, Gavin Hassel, and uh... You're reaching Joe. The only character from Pharos worth a second of consideration is Shiala. All the assignments on Pharos are boring as fuck too. Turn the water back on, hunt some Varen in the tunnel, looking for batteries. These are all fetch quests. Nothing interesting happens in any of these quests either. Okay, but come on, the Thorian is pretty cool and its mind control effect creates a chilling moment in Mass Effect, fitting the dark atmosphere of Pharos. The Thorian was cool before it started playing Bloons Tower Defense for 15 minutes by sending waves and waves of creepers and clones of Shiala at us. The worst part is it's not even hard. It's annoying and tedious. The only good moment of Pharos was the ending of it when you get the Prothean Cipher, but going through all that BS to see Shiala was horrendous. What about how you can choose to kill the colonists or save them all? Except it's not a choice. Saving the colonist is objectively the right decision. Even if you only get 30 war assets from it in Mass Effect 3, it's still more than zero. This is one of the moments in Mass Effect where being renegade is a punishment because there is no substitute for the colonist's war assets. Joe, you have 10 seconds to tell us why Pharaoh should go higher than D tier. Screw the both of you, I don't care. Place Pharaoh and move on. That's what I thought. Now we get to Novaria. In my opinion, this is a peak mission in Mass Effect 1. Novaria has a little bit of everything and does all of it exceedingly well. The assignments in Port Hanshan are some of the best in Mass Effect 1. The various ways you can get a garage pass to head to Peak 15 alone makes Novaria a standout mission. You can help Gianna in her investigation as most normally do, give Lorik Kian his evidence to get his pass, or turn the evidence into Anoleus. Not only that, but you can get through Novaria even faster by accepting to smuggle for Opold and turning his package into Anoleus. Or, and this is my favorite, you can rat Gianna out to Anoleus and they'll both off each other. Of course, that would be your favorite Donald, you monster. The corporate espionage you engage in here is enough to place Novaria in B tier. But it gets better when you hit peak 15. More like bottom 15, Novaria takes a steep drop after you leave Port Hanshin. Peak 15 is just the same tunnel over and over again until you reach Benicia. True, by this point in the game, you've probably seen these same tunnels on side missions numerous times. The reuse of assets in Mass Effect 1 has not aged well. Still, the actual mission on Peak 15 is excellent, and you have different paths. You can take the more direct route to Benizia, resulting in Captain Ventralis and his men turning on you. Or you can help the people suffering from illness, which will get you a pass from Dr. Cohen, giving you a straight shot to Benizia. The boss fight against Benizia is something. I have my limits. I won't let Benizia's chest distract me from how lame this so-called boss fight is. They hype Benizia up as this Asari matriarch with immense wisdom and power, with a legion of Asari commandos. Benizia barely fights you. When she does, she goes down like wet paper. The Krogan warlord from Theron was harder. The last highlight is the Rachni choice. Will you slay them or save them? Both choices have their merits. At this point in the story, we don't know that the Rachni were indoctrinated during the invasion. So as far as anyone knows, they're just violent cockroaches. However, the Rachni Queen promises never to let itself be seen again if you set her free. 
It's too bad Mass Effect 3 kind of invalidates this choice by having the Rachni be present as enemies regardless of what you pick. Overall, I think Novaria is an A-tier mission. Memorable characters, great side missions, and it's vital to the story since you take out Sauron's right hand. You can't go wrong with Novaria. It's the perfect final act to the first half of Mass Effect 1. The next three missions are the loyalty missions of Mass Effect 1. These are all pretty mid, if I'm being honest. Rex's family armor is all right. It's short and sweet and has good character building for Rex. Plus, doing this mission ensures you can keep Rex alive on Vermeer. Put it in C tier. Good, and now we have Garrus's mission to deal with Dr. Salion. Conceptually, this is a good mission. Hunting the Salarian growing illegal organs in people's bodies was an interesting idea. The outcome of this mission also influences Garrus's morality, pushing him towards Paragon or Renegade. Doing this mission doesn't even matter because regardless of the outcome, Garrus will end up being a vigilante on Omega, and it never comes up again. Seriously ask yourself, if this mission didn't have to do with Garrus, would you care about it at all? No, not particularly. Finally, speaking with your old brain, Joe, put the Salion mission in F tier. Okay, but this next one is even worse than Garrus's mission. We agree there. At least the Salion mission is short. To help Tally on her pilgrimage, you have to complete the assignment called UNC, Geth Incursions, where you go to outposts on five separate planets to do nothing but kill Geth. All of that is to give Tally a copy of some data. Worst off, it's not even necessary. Tally will accomplish her pilgrimage regardless of doing this mission by Mass Effect 2. And the only story impact for this mission is a one-off voice line during Freedom's Progress. I would rather play all of Andromeda again before I do this mission one more time ever again. I usually would cook anyone who says they want to play Andromeda, but this time I'll let it slide because Tally's mission is straight cheeks. Before we move on to the final act, let's talk about the DLC mission, Bring Down the Sky. I enjoy the premise of the mission. Batarians are aiming an asteroid at one of the human colonies, and it's up to Shepard to stop it. It's too bad that Bring Down the Sky relies on driving around in the Mako to do everything. It's not bad, and the mission ends with interesting choices that force you to think. Is it better to sacrifice the hostages to stop Balak once and for all? Or should you save the hostages and let Balak escape, allowing him to do more harm? I say put Bring Down the Sky in B tier. It has a good idea, introduces us to the ever-hated Batarians, and we can get Colossus armor from it. Now we move on to the big one, Vermeer, certainly one of the most iconic missions across the trilogy. Vermeer starts with that gas, dropping you right into the action as you fight through Geth encampments to reach the Salarian base. Also, thank God, finally a location that isn't a consistent shade of one dull color. Vermeer is a turning point for the game. It doesn't have any side quests, but that is because it's all about the mission and your squad. Once you get to the Salarian base, you learn Saren has a cure for the genophage. Naturally, this causes some tension with Rex. This is a great character moment for Rex. He had said before he gave up on the Krogan, but with this new information, it's apparent that he still wants his people to succeed deep inside. This is a fine example of the squad mates operating like genuine individuals instead of just followers of Shepard. You have to talk Rex down, and if you fail to pass the morality check or haven't gotten Rex's family armor, you'll have no choice but to gun him down or wait until Ashley does it. This is also an excellent moment for Ashley, showing that she'll never just be one to wait around as she watches the situation deteriorate. As much as I hate to see Rex die, the fact that he can makes Vermeer stand out even more. Rex's death has consequences in the future, in Mass Effect 3, because his brother Reeve will be in charge, which paints curing the genophage in a different light. After this, you get the iconic hold the line speech from Kirahi. You begin the operation on Vermeer, which served as an early template of the suicide mission. Delegating tasks to Ashley and Caden and accomplishing side objectives to ensure the mission goes more smoothly for the Salarians. And we can't forget the true highlight of the mission, speaking to Sovereign. We don't even need to give our opinion on this one. We'll let Sovereign do the talking. We impose order on the chaos of organic evolution. You exist because we allow it. And you will end, because we demand it. After you move on, you start setting up the nuke to destroy Saren's research station. But when things go wrong, you're forced to leave Caden behind and leave the planet with Ashley. 
Hold on, Donald. You're not forced to leave Caden. It's a choice between the two. And the choice is obvious. Ashley over Caden always, and not even because she's a woman, but because she's a better character. Caden is better in gameplay, and Ashley is borderline useless in Mass Effect 3. No wonder you can't clear Mass Effect on insanity difficulty. You rely on Garrus and Caden to play the game for you. Gentlemen, please, regardless of which one you like more, the choice to leave one of your own behind to die is what made Mass Effect a mainstay in so many people's eyes. That choice and many other things about Vermeer make it a clear S tier. Everyone looks forward to this mission as it serves as the first emotional impact of the trilogy. Time for the ending. I've split the ending into two parts since they're pretty distinct. The first half is Elos, find the conduit which starts out great with Shepard and crew stealing the Normandy and making a fast-paced drop on the other Prothean world. The sense of urgency in this mission is wicked. Saren already has a head start on you and locked the door to the conduit behind him, forcing Shepard to take the long way around. The environment of Elos is the best in the game. The old ruins indicate that this location hasn't been inhabited in millennia. The desperation is intensified by the recording of the Prothean, repeating that the Reapers cannot be stopped. Once you start chasing after Saren, you get stopped and talk to Vigil, which is the game's best moment. Finally, opening us up to the truth about what happened to the Protheans, how they delayed the Reaper invasion for our cycle, and what the stakes are for us if we fail to stop Saren and Sovereign. You return to the Mako with a new mindset. Hurry the hell up, because Saren has already made it through the conduit and has started his attack on the Citadel. Let's give Ilos Find the Conduit a hearty A tier. It serves as the perfect beginning of the end mission that leads us directly into the final mission of Mass Effect 1, Race Against Time, the final battle known as Battle of the Citadel. Arriving on the ruined Presidium is a stark contrast to how perfect and pristine it was at the beginning of the game. This is the seat of the galactic government and it's starting to fall. This site is probably the same view the Protheans had just as their Reaper invasion began. The combat on this mission is awesome. You know Saren and Sovereign are about to succeed, and tons of Krogan and Geth keep pouring out all over the place to stop you. But by this point in the story, your shepherd is probably an unstoppable demon, so you can press right through them. Further up this area, you can go straight ahead and push through the Citadel Tower defenses lined with Geth or you go down and take on the Krogan warriors, battle masters, and warlords. Once you get through, you're back where everything with Saren began, the Citadel Tower setting up the final confrontation with Saren. The boss fight against Saren is a copy of the fight you have on Vermeer, but that's not the important part. You can persuade Saren into playing and losing Russian roulette using your morality, putting an end to the Turian once and for all. Then we get our final big game choice, save the council or prioritize Sovereign. I don't know about you two, but the Council can get bent sideways. I agree, but no matter what you do, the Council comes back just as a different set of aliens, which is why I save them most of the time, so that I can humble these three clowns when the Reapers do eventually show up. Either way, watching the Alliance swoop in and save the day is a massive hell yeah humanity moment. After the cutscene, we head back to Shepard, who isn't quite finished with their job yet. Massive respect for Shepard here. They do what so many fictional characters fail to do and send someone down to double tap on Saren to ensure he's dead. But it's not over because Sovereign assumes direct control of Saren's body. And now we get the only actual good final boss in the trilogy. This fight isn't complex, but it still nails what it wants to do without any issues. I enjoy that the fight cuts back to the battle as things get more dire for the Alliance. However, we eventually pull through and end both Saren and Sovereign once and for all. Your choice to save or sacrifice the Council comes into play here. If you keep them, you meet with the Council, and they admit they're finally ready to let humanity join their ranks. Or you can kill them, and you'll just meet with Udina and Anderson. Udina then poses the idea of an all-human Council, which may be the only thing that Snake has said that I actually agree with. That obviously doesn't happen, and in hindsight, why would it? Surely the Asari, Salarians, and Turians would have backup counselors ready. That aside, our choice here is who will become the human counselor, Anderson or Udina. In the moment, picking Anderson makes sense. Udina has proven himself untrustworthy already. Also, with the war on the horizon, a military leader may be better. However, with hindsight, you should probably pick Udina. 
Anderson doesn't seem to like being a counselor, and even if he did, he gives it up to lead the fight on Earth during Mass Effect 3. I'm still picking Anderson to see Udina squirm like the worm he is. With all that said, Battle of the Citadel is obviously an S-tier mission. There isn't anything glaringly wrong with it, and it serves as the perfect conclusion to the first part of the trilogy. The stakes are high, the pacing is immaculate, and it cements the legend of Shepard in the Milky Way. Who in the f*** just pinged me? Oh, it's Bernie. He says he wants into the call. Good evening, gentlemen. Barack told me you'd be talking about the missions, and I have some unique thoughts I figured I could share. I see you have already completed Mass Effect 1. It looks good. Well done putting Pharos in D-tier where it belongs. And just like that, you already have better takes than Sleepy Joe? Bernie, you sound kind of different from the last time we spoke. Oh, sorry about that. I was getting over a cold. I hope my voice sounds better this time. I grew up in Brooklyn, so sometimes my accent doesn't come through correctly. I'm ready to start with Mass Effect 2 when you are. Oh, hold on a second. My food just showed up. I need to grab a bite, too. Give me an undisclosed amount of time to get my food, and I'll be right back. So, uh, Bernie, how's it hanging? You know, wake up, yell about healthcare and capitalism, the same thing I've been doing since steam engines were invented. Oh, God, those two can't get back here soon enough. So one of the key ideas of Karl Marx Didn't is that ask. a capitalist society is divided into two Don't classes, care. the bourgeoisie, or the rich, and the That's proletariat, great. or the working class. The bourgeoisie exploit uh -huh. the proletariat to increase their capital and maintain uh -huh. control by seizing control of social uh -huh. institutions like religion, government, uh -huh. and education. This prevents uh -huh. the working class from coming together and org- Okay, I'm back, boys. Damn, that Wendy's was hitting. Oh, thank God, Joe. Please change the topic to anything else. That may be the happiest I've ever heard you be to hear from me. Gentlemen, I had a revelation while I was eating. There is another DLC mission in Mass Effect 1 that should have been covered. It's called Pinnacle Station. Never heard of it. Not surprising, the source code to Pinnacle Station was corrupted and would have taken months for BioWare to recreate. As such, it was excluded from the Legendary Edition. Plus, it's not all that popular, even within the Mass Effect community. Almost no one minded it being left out, though some modders managed to get it back in the remaster. Unlike most DLC, Pinnacle Station doesn't have much in the way of the story. You go to a Spectre military training facility where you meet Admiral Ahern, a vet of the First Contact War. If I remember correctly, the gameplay is just completing all of the combat simulator trials. Now that I think about it, it's a lot like the combat sim from the Citadel DLC. There are four modes, capture, survival, hunt, and time trial, each with its map. That's it, really? You also get an apartment if you complete the hardest challenge, a simulation of a real fight from the first contact war. And to be fair, it is pretty hard. Is this mission something we'll miss? Not really. As Bernie said, there wasn't much discourse when we found out that Pinnacle Station wouldn't be in the Legendary Edition. Everyone pretty much shrugged and moved along. Combat and gameplay are not Mass Effect 1's strongest points, and Pinnacle Station makes that abundantly clear. I'd rather play Andromeda. At least that has the gameplay to back up having awful story elements. Is it time to move on to Mass Effect 2? That it is, we'll start with the first mission, which is technically two scenes combined into one. Prologue Save Joker and Prologue Awakening. The beginning cutscene is a great start. We're just going through space looking for Geth, and then boom, a huge ship appears out of nowhere and starts tearing the Normandy apart. Seeing the precious Normandy SR-1, the finest ship in the Alliance, get taken out was heartbreaking. A lot goes down here all at once. First Navigator Presley and another member of the Normandy crew just fall over and die and the whole ship starts burning as we watch Liara or the Vermeer survivor running looking for Shepard. I got mixed feelings on this going forward. On the one hand, walking around the CIC in silence, seeing space through the destroyed ceiling, is a legendary point of view. However, I believe the death of Shepard was the first spark that led the Mass Effect trilogy to its poor conclusion. Shepard's death allowed BioWare to do a fresh restart on almost everything Mass Effect 1 did. It pretty much destroyed all of the progress made in the overall narrative up to this point. We end up retreading a lot of old territory in two because Shepard died, such as team building again and having to go through the trouble of getting the council's trust for the second time. I still think watching Shepard plummet to the world below was a haunting sight and a great way to start the game. 
Next, we get to the cutscene watching Shepard's reconstruction and revival thanks to Miranda. God, what I wouldn't give to wake up and see Miranda looking down on me like that. Barack. Oh, shit, Michelle is here. Gentlemen, I'll be borrowing Barack for a bit. Anyway, the start to Prologue Awakening is all right. Immediately, you jump out of bed and have to get to work. The station you're on is under attack, and you have to make it to Miranda, who is guiding you through the mission. A good way to sneak in a tutorial for the game. As we move on, we pass by a bunch of dead bodies of the Cerberus employees at the Lazarus station. Things are really going down. Then we have the unfortunate pleasure of meeting up with Jacob Taylor. At least Jacob is honest enough to tell us he's with Cerberus, unlike Wilson. Speaking of Wilson, Miranda's first appearance is immediately offing the guy for being a filthy rat. This mission concludes with us leaving the Lazarus station and having our first meeting with the elusive man. As far as openings go, this mission doesn't match up to Eden Prime. The death of Shepard is contrived, and so is their revival. The destruction of the Normandy makes a decent set piece, but it's a shame that instead of continuing to build up the Normandy crew, we lost all of them besides Joker, Chakwas, and Adams. The vibes of this mission are telling me it goes in D tier. It's short and basically serves as a tutorial, but I think Barack is a little too preoccupied to place it. No, I'm here. I, uh, I don't think I'll be talking about Miranda anymore. Let's just put the prologue in D tier and head on to Freedom's Progress. Interesting premise here. We're going to investigate a colony that's been abducted, and when you arrive there, the place is seemingly devoid of life. That is until we encounter some Quarians, one of which bears a familiar I was going to say face, but helmet, I suppose. Oh yeah, how nice of Bioware to reintroduce us to a squad mate, starting with Tally, all grown up and leading her own team. Significant development for Tally here. When we last saw her, she was just a kid trying to get through her pilgrimage, but not only is Tally now in charge, she's commanding them with respect. I started clapping my hands when she told one of her people to either listen or take their ass back to the ship. The Quarians are here looking for one of their own, a kid named Vidor. But before getting to him, we must get through the drones and mechs that Vitor has taken control of. Now that I think about it, Vitor technically killed many of his people by reprogramming the heavy mech. BioWare designed the fight with the heavy mech wisely, giving us Miranda and Jacob as our first two squad mates so we could get used to using powers and ammo types to weaken shields and armor before attacking health directly. You should have seen Joe trying to fight it earlier. Bro kept charging into it and getting blown up. What else are you supposed to do? Use the static cover to rotate around the mech as you shoot at it. I know Vanguard players like to unga bunga their way through the game, but you have to turn your brain on at least a little bit. Joe being bad at the game aside, Freedom's progress ends with us learning who abducted our people, the Collectors, a new race of alien traders many don't know about. After talking about them, we can let Tally keep Vitor or send him to Cerberus. I won't lie, I did send the kid to Cerberus on my first run, and even I have to say that I felt bad when we saw him again on Tally's loyalty mission. Oh, Donald, I think your tiny Grinch-sized heart grew a little. Don't get used to it. Freedom's Progress is a decent mission. We're still in the prologue, and even though it reintroduces us to Tally, she can't rejoin us quite yet. I think the mission should go in C tier. Agreed, the prologue of Mass Effect 2 is pretty weak compared to 1 and 3, if I'm being honest. The combat isn't really that good either, and I hate fighting the drones. C-tier it is, and we're finally into the first wave of recruitment missions. The game strongly advises you to begin with Dossier the Professor, which is Morden's recruitment mission, so we'll start there. Now we're into the good stuff. Before entering the quarantine zone, we have Shepard flexing the fact that they have a grenade launcher strapped to their back when a Turian tries to stop them from entering. About time people finally start respecting the one true law of society, bigger gun diplomacy. Pretty funny that you can potentially bring Grunt and Garrus on this mission about the plague that kills all other aliens besides Vorcha and humans. Probably a good thing Tally didn't come with us on Freedom's Progress. The atmosphere of this mission is immaculate. Walking in, you immediately see burning bodies and come across two dead Turians that were trapped in a room and left to die by the Blue Suns. As you listen to the logs, the Turian documents the death of another individual named Dalis. But his sickness makes him hallucinate. He still hears his friend talking, and he muses that no one should die alone, like he is right now. You also come across a Batarian suffering from illness. This is maybe the one time I save a Batarian instead of killing him. Speak for yourself. I walk right by that guy every time. Not long after this, you'll hear your alien squad mate start coughing from the side effects of the plague. Garrus only says, 
That's not good. And Grunt is defiant and saying, I don't get sick. I'm glad Bioware called attention to the fact that alien squadmates are, in fact, not immune to the plague. Moving along, you come across looters, humans hiding, and more dead people, and you have to fight through Blue Suns and Blood Pack members, but eventually reach Morden's clinic. And now we get to meet one of the best written characters in the trilogy. First, if you have alien squadmates, Morden will immediately treat them so they don't die, demonstrating his skill in medicine. Listening to Morden rattle off like a lawnmower was a great way to establish his character. The dude is a hamster on coffee. Before Morden joins us, we'll have to turn the air back on and dispense the cure to the plague, and Morden asks us to keep a lookout for his assistant, who we find has been captured by Batarians who suspect him of spreading the plague. You can miss this, but if you find him, you strike a deal with the Batarians to let Daniel go. I uphold my part of the deal most of the time. I want to talk about the combat here for a moment. This mission and many others have a real problem with putting enemies on high up ledges that Shepard can't get to with cover that makes it difficult even to shoot foes. Never mind that Vanguard is straight up helpless a lot of the time. I agree, it's a problem. One of the few things that Andromeda did right was let Ryder jump. Fighting the enemies in environmental control is pretty annoying. More enemies on ledges and tons of enemies funnel out of the fan control room. Yeah, I may as well get it out the way now. Mass Effect 2's approach to combat is just having enemies come out in waves over time, which kind of blows. Thankfully, you can speed run this section on Vanguard and Infiltrator, skipping straight to the controls and ending the mission. Now we have Morden on our squad and can move on. I'd put Morden's mission in B tier. The atmosphere is excellent, and Morden's characterization is established well early on. Still, I gotta say, I don't enjoy actually playing the mission, if you understand what I mean. I'll co-sign that. Since we're on Omega, we'll move on to Dossier Archangel, obviously a fan favorite because of the character it involves. But it is a well-crafted mission, too. First, we talk to Arya to get information on Archangel, who is being hunted by the three big Merc groups in the Terminus systems, the Blue Suns, Blood Pack, and Eclipse. This mission brings back some of the sorely missing roleplay elements. As you sign up to join the Mercs, you can show this kid their gun is defective and tell them to sit things out or ignore him and allow him to take the risk against Archangel. Once you meet up with the Merc groups, you get to explore and talk to all of the major commanders on the Archangel assignment, giving us great world building as we learn about all three major factions we'll be dealing with in Mass Effect 2. All of the leaders on this mission have their stake with Archangel. Jaroth hates him because Archangel killed his brother. Garm is tired of Archangel killing his men and ruining his business, and Tarek is scared for his life. Kind of a step down to go from the so-called vanguard of our destruction to just some street thugs. Indeed, the stakes here have definitely gone down. Before you get to Archangel, you get the best renegade interrupt in the series. You're working too hard. Even a bleeding heart paragon like myself smashes that interruption, plus it weakens the helicopter for later. As you rush up to meet with Archangel, the puzzle pieces start coming together an idealistic Turian in blue armor and uses a sniper rifle. Just before the camera pans up, you realize it's Garrus. All right, not gonna lie. Seeing Garrus as the badass mercenary was a neat surprise. He may be a knockoff of Batman, but at least he's doing something interesting now. Too bad this completely invalidates your choice to make Garrus more Paragon in Mass Effect 1, but still, it's a neat reveal. If you've read the comics, this moment is elevated because Garrus had given up hope and knew his time was up and was having one last talk with his dad. Then he saw Shepard and said the odds just changed in his favor. But just as I'd expect from a Garrus-related mission, things go back to being boring because now we're literally playing tower defense as multiple waves of enemies walk across the bridge for 10 minutes. Honestly, you're right. This section of combat is very unengaging. On the bright side, you can hack the mech and have that take care of a lot of the shooting for you. The combat doesn't get much better after this either. Shutting the doors in the basement is annoying. One area is a long corridor with a flamethrower Vorcha in the way, and it's aggravating as fuck. Jesus, Joe, you're so bad at the game that you can't handle a single blood pack Vorcha? Nah, no way, Donald. You're capping if you're trying to tell me that the basement section of Garrus's recruitment mission isn't stupid hard. No, it is hard. I'm just built different. All right, bro. I can't wait to see your gaming skills one of these days. After finally shutting the doors, you run back to assist Garrus, and then the helicopter shows up and Garrus gets lit up. How did he survive all those bullets and a missile explosion? Rex dies to a few shots from Ashley's gun. Garrus stronger than Rex confirmed. 
Oh, no, we are not power scaling the Mass Effect squad mates. Don't even start that, Joe. We take out the gunship and the remaining Blue Suns and hurried Garrus back to the Normandy, where he quickly recovered, albeit with some scars. Honestly, not a bad mission. World building is great. Role play elements make a short return. And although the mission can be annoying at times, it's still a good challenge. B tier in my books. I would put it in B tier myself as well. C tier, the bridge section of this mission is boring. Just sit in one place and shoot. One of the worst aspects of Mass Effect 2's gameplay is its over-reliance on cover shooting. It's A tier for me. I think the mission does a good job at everything besides the combat, and even that isn't too bad. Plus, you get unique dialogue if you bring Zaid and Grunt to this mission. Averaging it out, I think we'll have to give this mission B tier. I think we should tackle Jack's recruitment mission next. It's called Dossier the Convict. A trip to Space Alcatraz to pick up a squad mate. I'm sure this will be fun. At the start of the mission, we get a nice tour of the prison and get to learn about it. Warden Curl started purgatory after he got tired of seeing criminals escape as a cop on Palavin. This is almost like a look into what Garrus could have become if he were left to his own devices. Curl obviously betrays us so he can profit off us. Naturally, that doesn't happen, and we fight to go meet up with Jack. I'll say this is probably the best introduction to any squad mate in the trilogy. The entire time we heard about Jack, Bioware cleverly refused to clue us into their gender. So I was expecting a man just to see the beautiful woman rise from the smoke. What is with you and bald women, Joe? She's not bald, Donald, and I told you what I'd do to you if you badmouth Jack in front of me again. You can get him later, Joe. Jack comes out of cryo and just goes monkey mode. She runs and casually destroys three heavy mechs with a single biotic charge. A bit of false advertising there. Jack seems unstoppable in cutscenes, but she's one of the frailest squad mates in the game. She dies more often than Tally and Morden. It really doesn't make sense for her to wield a shotgun without some defensive ability. Grunt gets fortification, Jacob gets barrier, and Tally gets energy drain. Jack struggles in gameplay, especially on insanity. We follow Jack's path of destruction and end up fighting the guards of purgatory and the prisoners that Jack set free during her rampage. The atmosphere is probably at its best here. Everything is chaotic, matching the nature of Jack's theme music. The combat here is mid, though. You walk through straight hallways and fight the prisoners and guards. What do you guys think of the final fight against Curl? I'm not too big a fan of it, to be honest. It's decent. Having to take out the shield generators to attack Curl at least added some depth into what would have otherwise been another shoot them until they die mini boss. After beating Curl, we catch up with Jack while she's throwing a temper tantrum overseeing a Cerberus ship. Just look at her, all crazy and stuff, so perfect. Joe, Jack would unironically turn you into a puddle of soup if you ever tried to hit her up. At least I'd die happy. Catching up with Jack, she's unsurprisingly not very cooperative. You can potentially threaten to knock her out, at which point Jack will say you may as well get ready to kill her then. Badass introduction to this character. A tier mission, despite the simple combat terrain, the introduction to Jack is immaculate and the atmosphere of the prison break is peak. I agree with you. Even if the combat is a bit dull, I still enjoy playing it more than the Archangel and Professor missions. I suppose I'll concede and say the Jack mission is A tier. I guess there really is a first time for everything. The last of the first wave of recruitment missions is Dossier, the Warlord. We're tasked with recruiting Dr. Okir, a Krogan who fought in the Krogan rebellions, so he's one of the oldest characters we've met in the games. Wait, Dr. Okir, there's a Krogan doctor? Contrary to popular belief and contrary to Morden's scoffing at the notion of Krogan scientists, yes, Krogan do have doctors. This is probably the weakest of the recruitment missions. It lacks the atmosphere built up in Morden's and Jack's and doesn't have the world building that we get in Garrus's. Jador yelling orders over the loudspeaker got old extremely fast. Plus, there aren't any interactions with her like with Kirill. So she's just an annoying voice for the entire mission. The terrain for the combat is at least better here. Instead of just holding a single point or going in a straight line, you have turns and bends to fight around. Sometimes you come up and the enemy has the high ground advantage on you, forcing you to think more as you fight. Combat is pretty much all this mission has until you run into Rana Thanoptis, assuming you spared her during Vermeer. She's up to no good yet again, but it's too late to kill her now. Then you meet up with Okir, who has been expecting us. Okir has an interesting outlook on the genophage. He approves of our destruction of Saren's cure, acknowledging that Saren's horde would not be true Krogan. 
O'Kear claims that surviving the genophage doesn't create strong Krogan. His experiments aim to create a Krogan that could ignore the genophage, one that would be a pure and perfect Krogan specimen. But Jador starts filling O'Kear's lab with gas, and we must stop her. Unfortunately, this mini-boss is horrible, just horrible. It's worse than Kirill. You kill all the Krogan that come out of the pod, kill a mech, and then kill Jador, who's cowering on the other side of the area. Back up to O'Kear, and he's, well, dead. But he managed to leave us one gift, his legacy, Grunt. We bring him back to the Normandy, where we get to choose between waking him up or leaving him in the pod forever so Cerberus can take him. Obviously, you wake him, and what does Grunt do when you get him out of bed? He gives Papa Trump a big old bear hug. More like a car accident. Shepard really ate that tackle. Here, Shepard must command Grunt's respect. You can do it with your words or with a gun. Either way, Grunt falls in line and becomes a squad member. I agree with what Bernie said earlier. This is the weakest recruitment mission. We don't get to stick with O'Kear long enough to learn more about him, and Jador is just a plain Jane antagonist. The best part of the mission is waking Grunt, which technically happens after the recruitment mission ends. Separating that, you get Grunt from this mission. It's probably D-tier. The only highlight is the single renegade moment with the injured Merc. That and Grunt are the only things saving it from going into F-tier. Good deal. Now, as per the game's pacing, we move directly on to the Horizon mission, which starts with the elusive man calling us to tell us that the Collectors are targeting the colony and that our former squad mate, the Vermeer survivor, is on the planet. Morden completes his countermeasure to the Seeker swarms, and we head off to the planet. This mission is probably single-handedly responsible for the Vermeer survivor's controversial reception among the Mass Effect fan base, but we'll get to that later. The mission begins with a cutscene of the colony and our former squad mate being attacked and frozen by the Collectors. Honestly, what the Collectors do before they capture you is nightmare material. The giant bugs inject you, and you just freeze up. And worse off, you're conscious the entire time. The mission is essentially a combat gauntlet, and it's not too bad. This is our first encounter with the Collectors, and it brings a difficulty spike. Harbinger occasionally assumes direct control of the Collector troops, and I think it's a welcome addition. Unlike most enemies, Harbinger continuously moves toward you, and its attacks force you out of cover and burn you. Pretty annoying to me. Even after you kill one Harbinger, another one takes its place. Learn how to play the game, Joe Jesus. Focus the other Collector troops while ducking Harbinger and then finish him off so you only have to deal with one. Sorry, Donald, I'm too busy actually being the president to get good at Mass Effect's campaign. Later on, you run into a mechanic who managed to hide from the Collectors. Delon clues us into how the humans in the Terminus feel about the Alliance. He blames the Alliance for placing the defensive towers there, believing they drew attention to the Horizon Colony. We move on and get to what I think many would consider the most insane difficulty spike in the Mass Effect trilogy. The final area of Horizon is hellish if you're unprepared and don't know what to do, especially on insanity difficulty. If you're playing the Engineer, Adept, or Sentinel classes and haven't gotten the Casa Locust, you're gonna have a bad time. Edie does tell you to take a defensive posture, but it's unclear precisely what that means. There's an area to the left that's your best bet. Otherwise, you'll be flanked from every direction, and your squad won't last long. Then we get a mini-boss in the form of a Scion, a pretty annoying enemy. I'm glad Harvesters took their place in Mass Effect 3. Periodically, the Scion will stop taking damage and charge up some barrier health. It wouldn't usually be a problem, except it can do so with like an inch of armor health left, prolonging an already long fight just at the end of it all. We eventually win the fight, and the Collector Vessel takes off with half the colony on their ship. We stopped them, but they still got a lot of people. Except for the Vermeer survivor, which is weird considering we watched them get frozen first. And Lilith, the woman they spoke to, gets taken. Missed opportunity by Bioware here. The Collectors should have taken the Vermeer survivor to add some more stake to the suicide mission. A weird tone change from the Vermeer survivor here. They arrive referring to Shepard as a god, and then they flip the script as soon as we mention Cerberus. On the one hand, I don't blame the Vermeer survivor for not believing Shepard. But at the same time, they refused to hear us out and consider what we were saying even a little bit. It's also incredibly annoying that you can't tell them you don't trust Cerberus at all and want to stop the Collectors. You can even do this with Tali, and she has faith in you. People can hate the Vermeer survivor all they want. 
At least this makes them less of a drone who blindly believes everything Shepard says, and they come around on you in an email later on. As you'd expect, things don't pan out well with our old squad mate, and we go our separate ways, ending the mission. I believe Horizon to be a pretty good mission. It's our introduction to the Collectors. The colony's atmosphere is well done, and it has a decent challenge to it, even if it is a tad annoying. I think this should be an A-tier mission. I enjoy the mission, and like that, it has good character building for the Vermeer survivor. Time to hit up our final three recruitment missions. Let's start with our old friend Tally, who is leading a research team on Heestrom. This mission, you know what, I'll let you boys go first. Any mission with Tally is goaded automatically. Also, the music is top tier. You're spitting, Joe. This is a Tally mission. You get introduced to the man, Cal Rigar himself, and the final area of the mission is awesome, giving you multiple approaches to the Geth Colossus. This mission also introduces us to the dark energy subplot of the trilogy. All right, time for me to interject. You cannot rate this mission highly just because it had Tally in it. First, the overheating mechanic is at best negligible or at worst just annoying. I don't even know why it was added. As for the dark energy plot line, that was abandoned, so I don't see how it factors into the ranking. The mission is intensified by you rushing to save Tally from the Geth, as most of her squad has already been wiped out and Tally is next on the chopping block. Come on now. We all knew Tally wasn't in any danger the entire time. Plus, the part where you have to get the explosive charges is just plain stupid. The giant block that falls and blocks the door is like eight feet tall. Are you telling me Super Soldier N7 Operative Shepard can't hit that pull up and climb over it? Hold up, Bernie might be cooking. Yeah, and I smell it burning. How can he say recruiting Tally is bad? Remove Tally from the equation and think about the composition of the mission. It's a long combat gauntlet with barely any dialogue. It introduces an abandoned plot line, and the final area isn't all that. It gives you multiple paths, but only really. The left side is worth going over. The middle area is suicide because the Colossus fires on you once you leave cover, and the right area cooks you under the sun. I'm not a fan of the Geth infinitely spawning until you take out the Colossus. The only good thing this mission does is introduce us to the GOAT NPC named Cal Rigar. Besides that, this mission is excessively mid. Please put Dossier Tali in C tier. What do you think, gentlemen? You know what, he's right. Thinking with my brain and not my head, this mission is not great. Screw you, this mission is still at least A tier. Typical Tally Simp, incapable of seeing reason. I like to stay as objective as possible, and I think Bernie has a point. Dossier Tally goes in C tier. God damn it, this is why we should have only limited this to people who have been president instead of including a primary loser president wannabe. Mad that I bring new fresh ideas to the table, Joe? I was cooking when I said the Citadel DLC was the true ending, and I'm still cooking when I say Tally's recruitment is C-tier. Please carry on to the next one, Barack. We'll do Dossier the Justicar next. This is Samara's recruitment mission. I stand at attention for the glorious introduction of Samami. It's a decent mission. We start by learning exactly what a Justicar is, and they're essentially super powerful space paladins that follow a righteous code. This mission introduces us to some side characters like Pitney Four and Detective Anaya, who assist us in our search for Samara. I'm fond of Anaya. She's a laid-back Asari detective who doesn't give us much trouble. We do a little bit of combat and catch up with Samara, who is taking care of some of the Eclipse sisters. Oh my god, I wish I was the one Samara was stepping on instead of that other Asari. I'm pretty sure she breaks their neck after this. At least then I'd die happy. There's something wrong with both you and Joe. Anyway, we strike a deal with Samara, help her find the person she's after, and she'll join us. After a brief chat with Pitney Four, we head off looking for our trail to Morinth. I like the addition of the Minigan X3 canisters that will improve the damage or range of your biotic powers. However, enough of the gas will kill you, encouraging the player to keep moving to new cover. The layout of the spaceport is dynamic, starting inside with areas of a lot of short cover. And then we transition outside and get to fight while looking at the gorgeous Ilium skyline. A small shout out to the encounter with Eclipse sister Elnora. This interaction tests whether the player has been paying attention. Elnora claims to be new to the Eclipse and that she hasn't killed anyone. But if you remember, Pitney Four tells you that all Eclipse sisters acquire their uniform by committing a murder. Elnora is definitely in uniform when you see her. As expected, she is guilty. In fact, she's the one who killed Pitney Four's business partner. It's pretty stupid that you earn renegade points for killing Elnora when it's apparent she's an active murderer and pulls a gun on you. I just wanted to ask her some questions and then kill her. But Shepard and company just let her run on by. 
It messed with my full renegade run. Another flaw of the morality system. We eventually get a mini boss against a helicopter, which was pretty lame. Then we come across some evidence incriminating Pitney 4. If you turn the evidence into Anaya and take care of Elnora, you get a little bonus at the end of the mission. Our final trial is getting past the one and only biotic god himself. I almost shit myself when I saw him. I didn't think the Eclipse would call upon the god himself to stop us. But thankfully, Shepard is a devout follower of the biotic god's teachings, and he resolved to help us take out Captain Wasaya. For a random Eclipse leader, Wasaya is quite cool. I don't know if it's her orange markings, but fighting her always stood out to me. She's undoubtedly cooler than other Merc leaders like Jador and Garm. We take out Wasaya, get the information Samara needs, and she swears her loyalty to us. B-tier mission, we have a few side objectives we can complete. The introduction to Samara is well done, and it brought us the glorious biotic god. Samami deserves the fattest S-tier in the world. You're just as bad as me, Donald. Put it in B-tier. Now, much like the original release of Mass Effect 2, we'll have to split the second half of the missions into a second disc, if you will. So the last mission we'll cover today is Dossier the Assassin, Thane's recruitment mission. I believe this mission is the perfect conclusion to the recruitment arc, if you will, of Mass Effect 2. You drive up to the Dantius Towers and immediately meet a squad of mechs that gun down some Salarians. Nasana Dantius, who you might recall from Mass Effect 1, has lost it and is ordering her mechs to massacre her workers out of fear. We meet up with a poor working class chap who we can save. He tells us the situation and we move up the tower. BioWare did a good job building up the mystery of the assassin. As you rescue Solarians, you hear about how he locked them in a room to keep them safe and saved another group from one of the mercs, establishing that this assassin has principles. One of the cooler scenes is hearing two of the mercs talking, and then one of them gets jumped and falls dead right in front of us. We also get one of the coldest renegade moments in the trilogy where Shepard is interrogating an Eclipse merc, and when he won't talk, we send his ass out the window. How about goodbye? Honestly, all interactions in that interrogation are worth it. If you wait, you can pick a renegade dialogue, press the guy up against the glass, and ask him what sound he thinks he'll make when he hits the ground, and if he'll hear it before he dies. Shepard was on that demonic timing with this one. We have one last area, a windy bridge with tons of mercs and drones on the tower. It's a magnificent scenery, even if it's a straight line. As you grow closer, you can hear Nasana on the loudspeaker becoming increasingly panicked. If you met with her in Mass Effect 1, you'll wax nostalgic about how you had to kill her sister and now you're here to kill her. But unfortunately for Nasana, we're not the one she should be worried about. Thane drops from the ceiling and just casually snaps a guy's neck. Throat punches a second guy, shoots a third, and then puts an end to Nasana. I don't even like Thane like that, and I have to admit that brother came in cold. It's a goaded introduction. The buildup we got on Thane leading up to this cutscene was expertly executed, and having us see his efficiency showed us why he's the galaxy's best assassin. It was nice of Bioware to finally give women in the Mass Effect community some eye candy. Too bad Thane literally says, I'm dying, right after looking all majestic in the sunset. Maybe a hot take, but this is the best recruitment mission. The combat is excellent, the introduction to the squad mate is executed perfectly, and it calls back to Mass Effect 1 with Nasana. I'm in agreement. It feels like Bioware put their back into it when they crafted this mission. We should put Dossier the Assassin in A-tier for being a standout recruitment mission. No complaints from me. And with that, we'll take an intermission and complete the rest of Mass Effect 2's missions. Okay, and we're back, ready to continue ranking the Mass Effect 2 missions. Wait, did Bernard leave during the break? It appears so. Hold on, he left me a DM. Bernie says he has to go, something about the arrival and that they're coming. I don't know what he's talking about. The arrival of what, his third heart attack? Doesn't matter, now put Dossier Tally in B tier now that the party pooper is gone. He also asked me not to let Joe and Donald do anything stupid with the tier list. Who does that motherfucker think he is? Regardless, I'll honor Bernie's request and leave Tally's recruitment mission in C tier. And now we begin with the loyalty missions. Let's start with Miranda, the prodigal. You sure you want to talk about Miranda, Barack? Isn't Michelle there right now? I'm fine, I just need to not vocalize all my intrusive thoughts. In this mission, Miranda requests us to help her relocate her sister Oriana and her family because Miranda's hyper-controlling father has tracked her down. 
It starts with no BS. We drive in and we're immediately met with a bunch of Eclipse mercenaries who try to stop us and we quickly show them why that was a mistake. I think this mission did a lot for Miranda's character. Before this, Miranda openly stated she didn't trust Shepard at all, to the point that she wanted to implant a control chip in us. And the only reason she didn't is because the elusive man apparently stopped her. And that does reflect itself at the start of the mission, since Miranda omitted to tell us that Oriana is her little sister and that she was the one who took her from Henry Lawson. Though to be clear, Miranda took Oriana for a good reason. Still, this underlines the one flaw Miranda has that keeps her from being perfect otherwise. She never puts her trust in anyone and is too secretive. She hid relevant information from Shepard, which turned out fine. But because she refused to tell Nickett the entire story, he ended up double-crossing Miranda and assisted her father. Miranda also spends about half of the mission coping when we realize Nickett has probably betrayed her. The girl wouldn't wake up to reality. This mission gets a little creative with the combat terrain and it's a welcome change compared to just straight paths. Some areas have conveyor belts that will block your shots, but they also provide moving cover for you. You can abuse conveniently placed explosive containers, and there are pits on the floor to pull enemies into as the biotic classes. We catch up with Nickett, and behold, he's a filthy rat, but I can't blame a guy for taking what he described as a great deal of money from Henry Lawson. That's an easy W. Well, it would be, but Nickett doesn't get to enjoy it because either Miranda or Enyala executes him. Extra points if you bring Jack on the mission because she'll enjoy Enyala making fun of Miranda's less conservative Cerberus outfit and asking Shepard if we're still recruiting. That's comical coming from Jack, who walks around wearing nothing but tattoos and some belt straps to cover her titties. We have a firefight with Enyala and her goons. Save Oriana, and then you can choose to let Miranda talk to her or just leave. It's a pretty basic premise, but the loyalty mission is vital to Miranda's character because without it, she has no depth whatsoever. And securing Miranda's loyalty is required if you want to keep her alive through Mass Effect 3. I think it's a mid-mission. It lacks any good atmosphere. It's just another fight on Ilium. Even if Miranda is a 10 out of 10, her loyalty mission is probably a C-tier. It's a bitter pill to swallow, but I agree Miranda's mission is C-tier. Now we're moving on to another loyalty mission. Let's do Jacob the Gift of Greatness. Well, it's a Jacob mission, so I'm sure there won't be much debate on this one, so why don't we all answer simultaneously? It's A tier. -tier. I'm sorry, did someone just say it's A tier? It wasn't me. Hear me out. Nah, you gotta be kidding no me. No fucking way, bro. Barack, we slander Jacob. I'm more boring than a rabbit turd tailor in this Discord server. This is a Joe Biden level L from you, Barack. I'm surprised. Gentlemen, you must understand that Jacob's loyalty mission is a pretty good mission. Have you lost your damn mind? Okay, Donald, let's chill and hear Barry out. All right, this mission is actually expertly crafted, so much so that you nearly forget it has to do with Jacob. You're going to the planet Aea to search for the Hugo Gernsback, the ship Jacob's father served on, because an SOS has been sent after 10 years since the frigate went missing. I'll say I'm glad the mission does something different and puts us in an outdoor environment in nature. Only seeing the inside of factories and warehouses got old quickly. The first part of this mission starts amazingly, setting up the atmosphere of a place where things have obviously gone awry. You listen to the audio logs and hear an officer talking about what they've done to the crew and their condition. The man mentions bruises, and the people forget about them after you distract them for two minutes. I always skip Jacob's loyalty mission, so I haven't a clue where this is going. If you speak to the beacon, it tells us that it was paused by Jacob's father over eight years ago. As you listen to more logs on the ruined ship, you hear a woman falling to mental decay caused by the local plants and another much more disturbing log that I think we'll refrain from going into detail on. As I recall, we run into a woman who is clearly not all there mentally. Like you have room to talk about someone's mental capacity. We save this survivor from the men who seemingly become feral after eating the local flora. Moving forward, we find a camp filled with nothing but women. And now you have my attention. We get a journal of what occurred on Aya. Ronald Taylor restricted the ship's food for himself and the other officers so they could stay sane so that the beacon could be repaired. Some mutinied over the decision, resulting in a casualty list after Ronald Taylor and the officers turned the mechs on them. A tough but understandable decision, Lord of the Flies type situation. It gets worse. The beacon was fixed after a year, but more casualties appeared, more incidents and brutal punishments. 
The members of the crew that fell to the decay were treated like toys, and the male crew members were flagged as exiled or dead, and the women were, to put this lightly, given to the male officers. Then the officers appeared in the casualties list, too. Ronald Taylor took full control of the situation and let things continue until he needed saving. What in the fuck? Who wrote this dark-ass story in my Mass Effect game? Jacob is not half bad in his mission. I'd say he's kind of interesting during it. Jacob resolves to find Ronald Taylor and set things right. As you move toward Taylor, he is constantly lying about the state of affairs. And when you meet him, he keeps going on and on about how everyone went crazy and locked him up in his hiding place. I remember this. Bro will not own up to anything he's allowed to happen. He's a genuinely reprehensible character. We put Ronald Taylor in the worse than Jacob tier for a reason. This mission has three ways you can deal with Taylor. You can send him to prison for 10 years for each year of what he did. You can leave him to get sorted out by the hunters. Or, and this is my favorite, hand him a half-charged pistol and tell him to kiss himself. Okay, Barack, I heard you out. It's F tier. You gotta be kidding me. It's all fine and dandy that Jacob's loyalty mission is well written. I'll admit the atmosphere is great and Jacob is almost interesting during it. However, this mission does not impact Jacob's character. He starts the mission believing his father is dead and ends the mission still thinking his father is dead. Nothing changed. Jacob goes back to being the same boring guy he always was. His loyalty mission also has no impact in the story either. We are legit just running an errand. I'll amend my original stance. Jacob's loyalty mission may not be important overall, but it's still decent. I'll give it C tier. Also, it does have some impact on him. In Mass Effect 3, Jacob says he wants to be there for Bryn and their baby. He at least wants to do better than his own dad. Oh, please, Jacob couldn't go six months before cheating on female Shepard. I doubt he's going to wait nine months for Bryn, let alone 18 years for their kid. I'll be fair and consider your stances. Jacob's loyalty mission averages out to a C tier. Once again, the game will require us to hit up a main story mission. The elusive man pulls us aside to tell us that a Turian ship disabled a collector vessel and we're tasked with boarding it to find information on crossing the Omega-4 relay. Holy fucking shit, this mission is the mother of all difficulty spikes. I will agree with Joe on this one. The collector vessel is insanely difficult for how early you acquire it. We'll get to that later. In this mission, we learn something harrowing. Edie finds the genetic structure of the collectors is similar to that of the Protheans. The Reapers have repurposed this long dead race into our enemies. It's a big reveal. This is as close to the Reapers being a major threat as we get in the main story of Mass Effect 2. And this provides detail of how the Reapers wage war on the galaxy by turning our own people against us. As you move deeper into the collector vessel, you find a massive chamber of pods so many that your squad will theorize that the collectors will eventually target Earth itself. We get to a control panel and access their data banks, but it's a trap. And now we prepare for one of the most brutal fights in the trilogy. This battle is a motherfucker. Multiple platforms containing collector troops, Praetorians, and Harbinger come after us. Hold up, Donald. Those things that send shockwaves out at us are scions. The Praetorian is the flying creature we fight on Horizon. You and Bernie incorrectly named it. My bad, both the enemies are equally annoying, so I got them mixed up. This gauntlet will give you trouble because the Scion and Harbinger can force you out of cover, leaving you open to the collector troops. It can be annoying, but it's honestly a good challenge. Careful placement of your squad will help you succeed. When you finally make it through the battle, we learn that the Turian signal that we responded to was fake and that the elusive man would never fall for such an obvious bait. He lured us here on purpose. You can elevate this moment by bringing Miranda along, who will deny that the elusive man really tricked us, showing that she still trusts him, but that her belief may be wavering a little. Then the collector vessel starts powering up, and now we need to get the hell out of here before we end up getting harvested. The music and atmosphere of this escape is peak. The collector troops are always used expertly, and this mission is no exception. Very true, Donald. The tension on this mission is unmatched. A Praetorian shows up to mess with us while some husks also show up. The collectors are throwing everything they can to stop us. After a final push through some more husks, we make it to our shuttle and narrowly escape before the collector vessel powers up. This was a well-needed mission after spending time recruiting squad mates and doing loyalty missions. 
This reminded us what we're really doing out here in the terminus system and why the collectors are such a threat. The collector vessel mission should go in A tier. It's challenging, has numerous dynamic battlefields, throws a wider variety of enemies, provides world building, and as a bonus, it unlocks advanced training so we can pick up improved weaponry. This mission saved the mid-game of Mass Effect 2 from being just a slog of recruitment and loyalty missions. Now we return to our loyalty mission bonanza with Jack Subject Zero. After going through the Cerberus logs, Jack has relocated the facility she was tortured in, and she wants to go there and blow up the place. It's a simple premise, but with character writing, we get the full details of what made Jack the way she is. Just like with Caden, Jack was forced to endure harsh training and torture because people believed that's how you improved someone's biotic potential. Jack was also conditioned to fight and to enjoy it. If she didn't hesitate, she would be filled with narcotics. An interesting point came up here. Apparently, the facility was operating without the elusive man's knowledge. Miranda will point out that the place seemingly went rogue if you brought her with you. Of course, Jack-o'-lantern isn't interested in listening. As we explore, we learn things didn't go down quite as Jack described. First, the other kids at the facility were used as guinea pigs for the experiments. They bore the worst of it so Jack wouldn't die. As Aresh tells us, the riot at Telton was started when all of the other kids attacked at once. And then Jack got loose, starting her rampage. For a character with such a short introduction, Aresh is interesting in the way he serves as a parallel to Jack. Jack returns to Teltin to destroy it all and rid herself of all her bad memories of the place. But Aresh wants to restart the facility to find out what was learned and justify all the suffering he went through. Both Jack and Aresh are coping just in their own way. Jack isn't having any of that though and decides that Aresh has to go. Rather, you can either talk Jack into letting Aresh go or order her to execute him. I'm not sure what to make of this choice, to be honest. No matter what you choose, Jack will mellow out and become a teacher in Mass Effect 3. You'd think allowing her to indulge in her murderous tendencies would create a different path for her. Regardless of your choice, you take a walk with Jack, exploring her old room, a nice little moment letting her reminisce about her time there, like how her desk was her best friend and how she killed her first man to escape. Once all is settled, you return to the shuttle and light the Telton facility like the 4th of July. If you let Aresh go, do you think he manages to outrun the blast? It's not like we checked to see if he actually left. I'm gonna go ahead and guess not. Anyway, I would put Jack's loyalty mission in D tier. Bro, what are you saying right now? Jack's mission is S tier. It does excellent character building and gives us more background into Cerberus. And Aresh is a pretty good NPC character. Joe, you said yourself the final choice of the mission doesn't have much impact on Jack's character development. No matter what you pick, you follow the same path. What's the point of indulging in her killer instinct if she will become a goody-good teacher regardless? Donald has a point there, and Jack's loyalty mission is pretty uninteresting. The challenge isn't there, and as neat as Jack's backstory is, it is unimportant to the overall story. I think D tier is a little harsh. We should put it in B tier. I think the parallel drawn between Aresh and Jack saves it from being mid. Y'all are wildin' out right now. I'll make my own tier list and set this straight myself. Of course, you two would like a mission that involves dropping a bomb on something. Newsflash, all the kids at the Telton facility are already dead. Very funny, Donald, but we're moving on. Time to do Morden Old Blood. Morden has asked us to help him rescue his student, Malon, from Krogan Clan Warlock on Tuchanka. When you get to the hospital, you're confronted with a Krogan Clan speaker. And let me tell you something, the emphasis is on speaker. This motherfucker rambles on and on about the revenge the Blood Pack will do to the galaxy and how tales of their destruction will echo on forever. Like, bro, shut up. Shorten this to 20 words or less. Another one of those renegade interactions I have no issue taking. The measly four Paragon points you get are not worth listening to this dude yelling an average Japanese light novel title's worth of words. Once you get past them, you explore the hospital and conversate with Morden about his work on the Genophage modification. Analyzing Morden's viewpoint on this, he views his modification as something as mundane as gardening, like he's clearing weeds. Morden has managed to remove all moral responsibility he has for the state of the Krogan. He's not responsible. The Krogan brought the genophage on themselves, and Morden's simulations indicated that without the modification, all-out war would have begun. An interesting viewpoint, Joe, given how much you simp for Bakara. This dude will defend the genophage, 
which causes Krogan women to experience the deaths of thousands of unborn Krogan babies, but then get angry with me because I don't like Turians because they launched an unprovoked attack on humanity. There's plenty of good reason for the genophage Donald. Well, Morden might begin to disagree with you, Joe, as the loyalty mission continues, we encounter a female Krogan that died trying to cure the genophage. When Shepard presses Morden on his genophage work this time, he's no longer so calm and cool about it. He blatantly denies the damage his work caused. Morden even admits to having a crisis of faith after dropping the modification and turning to the Wheel of Life, a Solarian concept similar to Hinduism. A break from all the serious stuff, we run into a Krogan weakened by all the experiments run on him. Shepard can give the guy a pep talk, claiming he's acting like a Quarian with a tummy ache. Tally will take offense to that. We finally make it to Melon, and it turns out he wasn't forced to work with the blood pack. He's trying to cure the genophage of his free will. Good God, BioWare really said, let's take a Solarian who are already infamous for being nerdy dorks and gave one of them that invader Zim ass sounding voice. Malin goes into detail as to why he's done this. He believes that the genophage caused the cultural genocide of the Krogan. Men fight over fertile females, and when they can't have children, the males leave to fight and die for credits as mercenaries, just as Rex did not to mention the untold physical and mental damage this must do to Krogan females. Of course, this is all supposition on Malin's part. Morden will continue to point out all their data pointed toward another galactic war. And to be fair, Morden is right. Without a leader like Rex and Bakara at the helm, the Krogan would have invaded again. After we finish talking, Morden does something that finally made me grow respect for him. He aims to kill Malon. Either stopping or allowing Morden to kill Malin has some significance here. Morden has spent this entire mission being adamant about the fact that he's not a murderer. Yet here he is, about to execute a fellow scientist in cold blood. Morden not being a murderer is some BS. The first thing we're told about him is that he's as likely to shoot someone as he is to heal them. I still chose to spare Malin. His experiments are cruel and his viewpoint is slanted but he doesn't deserve to die for trying to end the suffering of the Krogan. Malin leaves, and now we get to one of the most vital decisions in the trilogy. Will you keep Malin's data, or will you destroy it? As you all know, Morden will cure the genophage regardless of the data, but if you destroy it, Bakara will die, and her death could have some serious ramifications down the line if you happen to have killed Rex in Mass Effect 1. You'll end up leaving Erdnot Reeve in charge, and that's not good to put things lightly. Once you make your choice, the mission ends. Morden's mission isn't exactly the best loyalty mission in terms of gameplay or atmosphere, but things about it undeniably make it A-tier. It is vital to the overall plot, as it impacts the Tuchanka arc of Mass Effect 3. It begins Morden's development in seeing the wrongs of the genophage, also allowing the player to see the systemic damage it caused. No doubt a lot of the loyalty missions come off like we're just running errands for our friends, and while that's nice, it's better if these assignments actually have to do with stopping the Reapers, either directly or indirectly. Since we're on Tuchanka now, let's pivot right into Grunt's loyalty mission, which takes place on the planet. It's called Grunt Rite of Passage. Sweet baby Grunt is starting to go through puberty, and it's making him violent, well, more violent, and we're going to get him some help. Just get the boy some magazines and a bottle of Jergens, and lock him in his room for an hour. What the f***, Joe? Yeah, seriously, Joe, a magazine? You stuck in the year 1973 or something? The hub is free! I'm getting us off this topic. Grunt's loyalty mission starts with all dialogue, giving us insight into Krogan culture. When Krogans become adults, they undergo the rite of passage. Doing this will provide Grunt a place in the Krogan, allowing him to stand with Clan Erdnot. Talking to the Krogan on this mission cemented my love for them. The conversation with the shaman is fun. Putting that Varen Uvenk in his place with a headbutt is an amazing renegade interrupt. You know that gave Shepard whiplash. No way they headbutt a Krogan and didn't feel it. Now we move on to the best part of the mission, the rite of passage itself, a combat gauntlet where you battle against Varen, Klixen, and a goddamn Thresher Maul. Donald, you hated Garrus's recruitment mission for being one where you hold up and shoot in a singular place. How can you like grunts? Anything with Grunt in it is automatically better than Garrus. Plus, the variety of enemies in the right far surpasses what's in the Archangel mission. There is also something about the atmosphere of this mission. Being alone out in the wilds of Tuchanka with nothing but its wildlife coming at us. 
And while the fighting can get a bit dull, the significance of defeating a thresher maw on foot can't be understated. No one has done it since Rex. After the right, Eubank shows up and starts glazing my boy up. Unfortunately for him, it takes a bit more than pretty words to appease Grunt. So after Uvenk is dead, we meet back up with the Shaman, where Grunt is officially inducted into Clan Erdnot. Grunt's mission may not be the best, but it's essential to Grunt's personal journey. We help him find a place to call home, and this mission does determine Grunt's survival in Mass Effect 3. However, the combat is a bit long-winded. And one note, I would give it a B tier. My son deserves an S-tier. It's C-tier at best. The world building with the Krogan and its importance to Grunt shouldn't negate the fact that the main gameplay of this mission is just shooting for 10 minutes from a singular location, which isn't even that good. You legit either have to kill the Thresher Maw or wait five minutes for it to end. We're breaking even with B-tier and moving on to Garrus I for an I. Garrus has tracked down Sidonis, the man who betrayed his squad and is seeking revenge. We go to the Citadel looking for a guy named Fade. We meet up with Avalos, who directs us to the real Fade, who is just Harkon, the guy from Korra's den who leads us to Garrus in Mass Effect 1. When we do eventually meet up with him, he hauls ass. And now we're chasing after Harkon through the Citadel warehouse, in stark contrast to Garrus's recruitment mission. Instead of being held up in one location, we're constantly moving to different areas and our opponent is the one hiding. Garrus is finally being a bit interesting here. He's adamant in his desire to kill Sidonis and is willing to beat Harkin within an inch of his life to get his information. The way Garrus beat the piss out of Harkin was hilarious. He had it coming, not gonna lie. Bro disrespects female Shepard in Mass Effect 1. We head to Orbital Lounge and before meeting with Sidonis, we have a rare moment. If you're trying to take the Paragon route, Shepard and Garrus will be at odds with each other for the first and only time in the story. About damn time this Turian grew a backbone. I think this is where the mission is at its best. It is easy to give Garrus what he wants and end the mission without any conflict. But if you try to rein him back in, you'll get more dialogue about Garrus. For Garrus, letting Sidonis get away with this is a gross injustice and nothing Shepard says will change his mind. However, if you let Sidonis talk, his words of guilt will get to Garrus. And it's lame. Leave it to Garrus to finally start becoming his own character to fumble at the last moment, ultimately. He goes into this entire thing with the desire to kill Sidonis, and he just gives it up. The mission ends with Garrus musing over seeing the world in black and white and being unable to handle all the gray. In the renegade outcome, Garrus shoots Sidonis, and he's ready to move on. Garrus' loyalty mission should go in D tier. It has no importance to the overall plot, and Garrus himself doesn't develop from the mission. The only way to get some extra depth out of him is on the Paragon path. Your hatred of Garrus has gone too far, Donald. No way are you saying we should put Garrus's loyalty mission lower than Jacob's. I'm with Donald here. Garrus's mission is just another one of those errands you run for your squad mates. And even in the conclusion, there's no character building for Garrus. Regardless of the outcome, Garrus thanks you for helping with Sidonis, and that's the end of it straight into D tier. Jesus fucking Christ. I thought the bad takes would end when Bernie left. I know you've seen the comments, Barack. The people believe Garrus is S tier and his loyalty mission should be higher. I love Garrus. He's a top companion and I'm always happy to see him in the game, but we can't pretend his character is anywhere near as complex as a lot of the other squad mates. And that bears itself in his loyalty mission. Next, we have Samara, the Ardot Yakshi. Now we're in the part where BioWare clearly ran out of time because this mission has no combat at all. I believe that's deliberate. Given the nature of the assignment, a big firefight would not make a lot of sense. We're going undercover on Omega to track down Morinth, the person Samara was looking for when we recruited her. Morinth is her Ardot Yakshi daughter, a serial killer with a genetic defect that makes the Asari melding process lethal. The highlight of this mission is doing crowd work to lure Morinth out to Shepard. By picking the right actions in the club, you'll get Samara's daughter to like Shepard as their next victim. You can pick up some extra dialogue options by listening to Neff's journal and talking to people in the club, allowing you to trick Morinth easily. It's ironic. Morinth has gotten by for centuries by manipulating people into sleeping with her so she can kill them. But here she is falling for the exact same tricks at the hands of Shepard. That's how you know Shepard has that dog in him. When you're with Morinth in her apartment, 
You can technically fall for her charms if your morality isn't high enough. But Samara will show up for you before Morinth gets you. Then, oh yeah, it's time for some Asari on Asari action, sweet home Alabama style. And then an interesting decision comes up. If you have the morality, you can help Morinth and kill Samara. Morinth will then begin impersonating Samara, and no one on the crew besides Kasumi will ever find out. And as I said in the squad mate tier list video, it isn't worth it. BioWare did not commit to making Morinth a full-blown squad mate. They legit write her out of the game until she reappears as a banshee on Earth. To be fair, Samara does say you'll regret your choice. Anyhow, I think this mission should go into F tier. The first part of it is all right, but it doesn't have much in the way of consequences. And a mission without combat needs to be heavy in the narrative department to make up for it. And Samara's loyalty mission doesn't meet the bar. Sorry, Samami. Now we're going to skip Tally's mission and come back to it later. Next up is Thane Sins of the Father. Another no combat mission, we're on the Citadel trying to help Thane track down his son Kolyat, who has turned to a life of crime as an assassin. Now this mission has some great moments. First, you can find this kid named Mouse, who you can interrogate for information, and Shepard goes on their demon arc and beats Mouse. Or you can be nice to the kid and he'll eventually come clean for Thane's sake. Mouse is also the source of the Shepard VI. That aside, Mouse tells us the guy Kolyat is working for is Elias Kellum a new big shot on the Citadel. We work with Captain Bailey to get Kellum in a cell for more interrogation. This is a highlight of the mission. You can handle interrogating Kellum in a few ways. Shepard is the good cop and Thane is the bad cop, or vice versa. I'm fond of being the bad cop and beating the brain matter out of Kellum, but if you get your Spectre status back, you can just flex the fact that you're above the law and Kellum will immediately come clean. The quickest interrogation in history. You can also threaten to pardon my language, cut Kellum's balls off, and sell them to a Krogan. A call back to something we're told in Mass Effect 1. Anyway, our target is a Turian politician named Joram Talid. And now we begin perhaps the least fun part of Mass Effect 2. No kidding, following Talid through the streets of the Citadel is just awful. There's no way around it, and if you don't do it, you'll fail the mission. The only thing saving this part of the mission is the run-in with the worker, giving us a funny renegade dialogue option. We catch up to Kolyat just as he begins his chase for Talid, and we corner them in an apartment. When we catch up, we can defuse the situation by shooting a lamp and punching Kolyat, allowing Talid to escape. Or, and this one is pretty crazy, show Kolyat he ain't shit and kill Talid ourselves. And now comes the actual impact of this mission, the dialogue between Thane and Kolyat. Mass Effect 2 is notorious for being a game where we're helping our squad mates with their daddy issues. In this particular case, Thane is the bad father. Kolyat is the one you sympathize with here. His mother died and his father was absent, which caused Kolyat to go down this path. After their heart-to-heart, -heart, Captain Bailey allows the father and son some time alone to reconcile. The mission ends with Bailey seeing if he can get Kolyat community service, despite his crimes being deserving of worse. I believe this to be a better version of Samara's mission. The emotional impact is present and this begins Thane's rehabilitation, as this mission finally gets him to reconnect with his son. Put it in A tier, Thane's loyalty mission is well told and provides tons of depth into his character. I don't know, following Tay lead is so unbelievably awful that if it weren't for the rest of the mission, it would go in F tier. I can't let that slide. However, this is probably the most emotionally driven loyalty mission, and for that, I think it can be at least B tier. I enjoy the renegade moments, and Bailey is pretty cool. I'm with Barack, put it in B tier. Time for the two DLC squad mates loyalty missions. We'll begin with Zaid, the price of revenge. Zaid first introduces this mission to us as a request to rescue the refinery workers from the Blue Suns. But Zaid's real objective is to get revenge on Vito, the man he founded the Blue Suns with. Zaid being related to the Suns is something that comes up if you bring him to meet with Tarek on Garrus's recruitment mission. But here we find out just how far it extends. I have to give Zaid some points. When the mission starts, he prioritizes accomplishing his goal of getting it back in blood and won't let Shepard stop them. He creates a fire with hopes of trapping Vito. And when he runs, we're tasked with chasing after Vito or stopping the fire to save the workers. This is one of those, are we the baddies kinds of situations. None of these workers deserve to die, but we need to chase Vito to secure Zaid's loyalty. 
If you choose to pursue Vito, we run after him as the refinery explodes all around us, the sounds of the workers screaming as they burn and suffocate to death. It's a harrowing mission if you pick this path. Eventually, you'll catch up with Vito, and Zaid will give him a quick shot to the leg, then burn him alive. Alternatively, you can save the refinery workers, resulting in Vito escaping and Zaid being less than happy with us, causing you to fail the loyalty mission. Unless you have enough Paragon, that is, in which case, Zaid will see reason in Shepard's words and get over it, allowing you to secure his loyalty. I wonder if BioWare realized it was too much to make players kill innocent people to get a squad mate's loyalty. There's also another outcome that is pretty insane. If you don't do Zaid's mission until after the finale, you can leave him to burn in the fire he started. Zaid's loyalty mission is pretty good for a character that's otherwise subpar. The exploding refinery is a great place to fight in. The mission has multiple outcomes that can satisfy both Renegade and Paragon players. And Zaid is pretty dope in this mission. As Donald would say, he isn't just a follower of Shepard here. However, Vito is pretty uninspiring as a character, and ultimately this mission has no impact on anything at all. Stick it in C tier. I agree. As neat as the various outcomes are, it's still pretty mid. Now we move on to Kasumi's stolen memory. Oh, baby Kasumi, let's fucking go, brother. You could tell that Bioware put a lot more work into Kasumi's DLC than they did Zaid. It bears itself in the mission. We're helping Kasumi recover a gray box, a device containing information about Kasumi's dead partner, Keiji Okuda. Please don't mention that name in my presence, Barack. You're cucked, Joe. You'll never romance Kasumi, KG-1. She would rather be with his ghost in the synthesis ending than with you in 100 years. Fuck you, Donald. You really didn't hold back there. I may be a simp for the Asari, but even I think Joe is way too cringe with Kasumi. He'll get over it, carry on with the analysis, Barack. Kasumi's mission blends in some stealth with combat as we try to get into Donovan Hawk's vault to find the gray box. You investigate the vault and track down Hawk's DNA sample, get a voice sample, and shut down the power. What do you mean by stealth? We complete many of these tasks in plain view of all Hawk's guests. If you take the balcony entrance to break into his bedroom, you fire guns or knock the guards off the edge, and they scream for 30 seconds straight. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about crushing your delusions, Joe, but someone has to snap you back to reality. Besides, you've still got Jack. That's true, Jack is better than Kasumi anyway. If we've all made up, after you disable security, you get into Hawk's vault, filled with tons of references to other media. You've got an ogre from Dragon Age Origin, the head of the Statue of Liberty, which references the scene from Planet of the Apes from 1968, to name a couple. The real amazing find in this mission is the legendary M12 Casa Locust. The goat weapon, if you're playing Sentinel, Adept, and Engineer. Once you find the gray box, Hawk's big head shows up looking like Zordon from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and he starts running his mouth. You can stop him by shooting some artwork, starting the combat. The music goes hard here, but the combat is pretty standard, ending in a boss fights against Hawk in a helicopter, a rather one-note fight. But the cutscene does a lot of heavy lifting here. Kasumi shows off her ninja skill by jumping onto the helicopter, and disabling its shield from close range. After defeating Hawk, we leave and learn from a recording of Keiji that the information in the gray box could start a war and that he wants us to destroy the data along with all his memories of Kasumi. Kasumi wants to hold on to it, so we have a choice. Let her keep it or destroy it ourselves. Kind of pointless. Kasumi pieces the data back together in Mass Effect 3, so it comes down to whether you want Kasumi to stay attached to a recording of her dead boyfriend. I delete them out of spite. Unfortunately, I will say it goes in C tier. As enjoyable as Kasumi is, her mission doesn't match up to B tier due to her status as a DLC character. There's no central story importance, and there isn't much change for Kasumi in the future. Now we're going to move on to the DLC mission. Okay, did anyone else see that? It was weird, I heard this loud ass horn too. It seemed kind of familiar, but never mind. we're going to move on to the next mission. We've got two more loyalty missions left. Why are we headed toward DLC? I believe it is better to cover Tali and Legion's missions later on, so we're jumping to the DLC mission called Overlord. The elusive man has tasked us with investigating one of his operations that has gone off the grid. 
When we arrive, we learn that a rogue VI has taken over the facility and killed most of the people there. A lot of this mission plays out like a damn sci-fi horror film. Pretty much everything you can interact with causes the VI to start yelling nonsense at you as it stares blankly. Once you take out the satellite to stop the VI from uploading itself to the extranet, you meet up with Gavin Archer, the only survivor of whatever occurred here. It's a classic tale of humans trying to gain control over artificial intelligence by interfacing with it directly. Of course, things went wrong here. Has no one in Mass Effect seen a sci-fi film? Anyway, we're tasked with going to the overload stations to override the controls to end the lockdown at Atlas Station. Driving around in the Hammerhead is pretty lame. It controls better than the Mako, but it is made of tissue paper. Shutting down the stations is all right. Vulcan Station is probably the worst of the two. I don't know why they added a platforming section. I'm really fond of Prometheus Station, though. To get inside, you must dodge the cannon fire as you disable the shield around the Geth ship. Once you get inside, you can listen to the research logs hearing the scientists express their worry about being surrounded by dormant Geth that, if released, will surely slaughter everyone, which is exactly what happens. Small shout out to the droid in Vulcan Station having some technical difficulties. Yeah, not so fond of the bots now, are we? Once you shut down the override, the Geth wake up, and now we have to race out of the ship before we get overwhelmed. The rogue VI cuts off our path a few times, trying to trap us, but we eventually get through and leave. Finally, we head to Atlas Station to end things once and for all. Atlas Station is when things start to slowly come together. As you listen to the audio of Gavin talking, as he details how his brother's mental condition allowed him to communicate with the Geth, already you can tell something really messed up happened here. The VI starts guiding us, and as we follow the path, we learn that Gavin planned on connecting David to the Geth to influence them. What drove him to this was the elusive man running out of patience. Bruh, the elevator section here is pure nightmare fuel. The squad was standing around in silence and I was trying to figure out how no one was losing it. Yeah, this game further cemented my life choice to always use the stairs no matter what. Once we get out of the Tower of Terror, Shepard separates from the rest of the squad and sees everything that went down between the Archer brothers. As you grow closer, the previously unintelligible speech becomes clear. The VI has been saying, please make it stop. Now we know this is no mere VI. The final fight is stopping the VI from uploading itself to the Normandy, where it will piggyback to the rest of the extranet, taking down the entire galaxy. A pretty tense moment. You're trying to balance stopping the upload while being attacked by the Geth being spawned in, all while hearing the dialogue between David and Gavin as things started going out of control. In the end, you finally see the horror that occurred here. Nah, man, this is pretty gruesome even for me. Just end me, bro. Not about to have my eyes forced open like that while feeding tubes are shoved down my throat. This is a pretty unpleasant sight. Gavin shows up and tries to tell us how things were meant to be, but I mean, look at him. You're met with two choices here. Let Gavin take David back to Cerberus or take David to Grissom Academy. And this is pretty obvious. Here's the deal, as much as there is no right or wrong choice in Mass Effect, the game lays it on pretty thick that sending David to Cerberus ain't it. You don't even get Paragon or Renegade points for either of these options, so what's the point in sending the kid to Cerberus to endure more of this torture? Damn, Donald actually sounds like he's feeling sympathy for another human being, a surprising sight. Overlord is an excellent DLC mission with a scary atmosphere with the rogue VI and the Geth, well-paced and ends with a super iconic scene. Overlord also has some impact in Mass Effect 3 as well. I would give it an A tier. Traveling in the Hammerhead and Vulcan Station holds it back. Now it's time for a big boy mission, Lair of the Shadow Broker. The Broker DLC plays out like a movie. You meet with Liara on Ilium and tell her we have information on the Broker for her. It seems Liara's investment here is rescuing her friend, a toad named Farron, who helped her recover our body from the Collectors. Liara asks us to meet her at her apartment, but there's an attempt on her life before we get there. We then have the honor of meeting pretty much the coolest Asari ever, Spectre Televasir, who is investigating Liara's incident. So base for saying Vasir is cool, Joe, I knew there was hope for you. We search Liara's apartment for clues leading to the Draken Trade Center, which has a timely eruption just as we arrive. We race up to see if Liara is still alive, which she obviously is. Turns out Vasir is the one who took the shot on Liara. She's working for the Broker, who isn't too fond of Liara for betraying them and giving Shepard's body to Cerberus. Probably the coolest part of the mission here, we begin our chase for Vasir, first fighting through the Shadow Broker's agents and getting into a Skycar with Liara, beginning a cinematic high-speed chase. 
This isn't really anything special, but hearing banter between Shepard and Liara is enjoyable. Look out for the truck. We crash at a hotel, and more of the broker's agents come after us. I enjoy this part. The enemies fly in from different directions, encouraging us to keep on the move as cover becomes less viable. Once you get through them, you start going after Vasir, who was injured in the crash. The hotel we're at is called Azure, apparently. It's a resort with an exotic edge, my type of place. What does Azure mean? It's some Asari slang for a part of the body in some areas of Ilium, mainly in the lower reaches, towards the bottom. OK, but which part of the Asari body is it? I just told you. When we catch up with Vasir, she takes a woman hostage, and we get to play some renegade or paragon. Pick Paragon, and you can bluff that you have no problem shooting the hostage. You are a specter, after all. By this point, even a Paragon shepherd has sacrificed human lives to save the Council. Vassir doesn't realize who she's dealing with. The renegade outcome is telling Vassir she ain't sh** and that she's too scared to fight without a hostage like a coward, telling her she should stick to dancing. You can also straight up fail to pass the morality check and either wound the hostage or you'll concede to Televasir and literally drop your thermal clips. No, for real. If you pick this, you'll have no ammo and need to pick them up. I don't understand how Bioware fumbled the final boss of Mass Effect 2 when they proved they could handle boss design with Vasir. She is very dynamic with her charge ability, constantly changing position as you fight and throwing out shockwaves to keep you out of cover. Basir will temporarily retreat and call upon drones and more broker agents to fight you. It's simple, but this is probably the best boss fight we get by Mass Effect standards. Extremely wasted potential by having Vasir die, she demonstrates the shady side of being a specter. Working with the broker may be dirty business, but if it ensures the stability of Citadel space, then so be it. With the fight done, we rejoin Liara, who, if you're romancing, will express sadness over your death claiming that things can't go back to normal after all her mourning. But let's be honest, she's still into us. We get to probably the weakest part of the mission now, going outside the ship on Hagalaz. It's a gorgeous view, but it's a bit long-winded, and the final area can be a pain in the ass if you die once and have to start over from scratch. It's just something that gets in the way of seeing the broker. So skipping to the inside, we meet up with Farron, who is still alive but being tortured. We must shut off power to save him, meaning we need to meet the broker directly. After fighting a few more of its men, we meet the shadow broker himself. The broker certainly delivered. Its tone is almost comparable to Sovereign's. It sizes up your companion to sell them for a price. The broker knows everything about your squad mates. Everything from Grunt's origins to Tally's failed mission on Haystrom. It's pretty funny that the broker implies Jacob's death will cripple Cerberus. Even the folks in the Andromeda galaxy know that's Cap. Now we begin our battle against the broker. And while it's not mechanically as good as Vasir's, it makes an excellent thematic impression. First, the broker casually KOs one of our squad mates, leaving Liara and Shepard to deal with things together. Big dude just lays fire down on us, and you can't get close because the broker as a yog is even stronger than Krogan. Yet that doesn't stop Shepard from getting up close and personal. And let me tell you, Shepard has some hands on him. Bro is straight up boxing. Once Shepard distracts the broker, Liara takes him out using his own energy field. The Shadow Broker mission ends with Liara assuming the role of the broker, which carries over into Mass Effect 3. Liara uses this position to find the Crucible data in the Mars archives. Liara caught a lot of flack because she completely changed character in Mass Effect 2. But what Lair of the Shadow Broker does is provide some context into what made Liara so different. Shepard's death and the loss of Farron made Liara harden up so she could make good on all the mistakes she made. However, Liara was really only putting up an act. Once all the pressure was eased off, she let loose. You can then meet with Liara on the Normandy for dinner, where you can either get along as friends or rekindle your relationship. I'll say it, Lair of the Shadow Broker is S-tier. My only real complaint about the mission is that it's DLC that's vital to the narrative of the trilogy. And back in the day, if you didn't have it, you'd be missing crucial context on Liara being the Shadow Broker. The remaster fixed this, but it still bears repeating. Stories like this should never be paid DLC. Great DLC and great action. We finally meet the Shadow Broker, who was mentioned way back at the start of Mass Effect 1. It strengthens Liara's character, and it carries into Mass Effect 3. 
Back to the main game, we do Reaper IFF, which doubles as a recruitment mission as well. Holy hell, this mother mission, BioWare really said, what if we take husks and scions and center an entire assignment around them? What's this? The mighty I'm built different Donald Trump can't handle a few walking husks? Don't start with me, Joe. This mission isn't hard, but it does the same thing as Pharos and just swarms you with annoying enemies, which only creates an illusion of difficulty. We're getting ahead of ourselves. We go to this dead Reaper to retrieve and identify friend foe device to pass through the Omega-4 relay. The atmosphere of the dead Reaper, as we hear all of the scientists, slowly fall to the effects of the Reaper's indoctrination. The fact that indoctrination still works even on inactive Reapers is horrifying. Some of the Cerberus crew even have their memories swapped. I can't hold back anymore. There is nothing less inspiring than designing an entire mission around fighting husks. What were they thinking? Why not add collectors to this mission? Once you get through the first couple of waves, you end up meeting up with a Geth that calls you Shepherd Commander. This is Legion, our final squad mate for the game. Another issue with this mission is it operates as a recruitment when you might have literally one mission left. Legion splits off from you and it's another gauntlet of fighting husks and scions until you reach the Reaper Corps. It's really hard to focus on the fact that Shepard and friends are aboard a freaking Reaper because of the way husks can box you in while scions repeatedly fire shockwaves from a distance. Even if you prepare with crowd control abilities, this mission takes time to get through. Once you do, you see Legion get taken out by a goddamn husk, which is just wild to me. Legion, weakest squad mate in the trilogy. Imagine losing to a husk. Now we get to shoot at nothing but husks as we wait for the Reaper Corps to reveal itself. And you have to do this three times. You can probably speed it up with the cane, though. Once you destroy the core, you get the IFF, grab Legion, and head out of the Reaper before it plummets to the brown dwarf below. I have never once looked forward to this mission for a multitude of reasons. First is the gameplay, second is the fact it begins the timer for the suicide mission, and third, the entire final room just blows. The only redeemable thing about the Reaper IFF mission is Legion's introduction, which is memorable. My mouth dropped hearing a Geth speak clear English. I'm gonna say that meeting Legion doesn't really save this mission for me. It may be the worst design main story mission yet. On Infiltrator class, I will outright try to run past all the enemies and try to quickly hack the door to the Reaper Corps to skip this BS. It goes in F tier. With the IFF mission done, you're officially on a timer, two missions before the Normandy crew is abducted, the perfect amount of time to do Tally's and Legion's loyalty missions. I saved Tally's mission until now because it plays out a bit differently if you bring Legion along. Tally is on trial for sending active Geth to the flotilla. And how do we prove her innocence? By bringing a full-blown operational Geth onto the ship. I do not understand how the Quarians let that slide, but whatever, suspend your disbelief, I suppose. We start with the trial of Tali, who has been stripped of her original ship name, being forced to adopt Vos Normandy, which is a bad sign already. We're introduced to the Quarian admirals, Ron, Chorus, Zen, and Geralt. Each of the admirals are given their own characterization. Chorus is against Tally in the trial, but seeks peace with the Geth. Geralt is on Tally's side, but favors war. Admiral Zen wants to take back control of the Geth, and Ron is too wishy-washy to make a choice. Legion has input in the dialogues with Zen and Chorus, so bringing him along adds extra flavor. You can also run into the goat Kalriger and Vitor here. So long as Vitor isn't stricken with PTSD, you can ask both of them to speak in Tali's defense, which will come up later. Another critical thing to do is fish all of the admirals for information on the backroom politics taking place. Tali's trial is just a farce. The main objective is to determine whether the Quarians should retake the homeworld or seek out a new planet to call home. This is probably the best world building in Mass Effect 2. This introduces us to Quarian leadership, showing us how they operate, and all this dialogue comes into play in Mass Effect 3. But now it's time to board the Alari to see if the Quarians there manage to survive the Geth attack. As expected, the ship is crawling with Geth. As we explore and make it through the ship, the logs tell us that the Quarians were up to something dangerous. Tally theorizes that her father had the Geth activated breaking the Quarian's oldest laws since they lost Rannick. I think it is essential to press Tali on the fact that going to war with the Geth is risky. We'll get some insight into what suited life is like for her. Everyone else in the galaxy can touch and smell, something Tali and every other Quarian cannot do. 
Even basic intimacy could kill her. In the end, we come across the body of Tali's father, and we're prompted with one of the rare mandatory Paragon interactions. Always hug Tally. We take out the remaining geth and find evidence clearing Tally's name. And as the recording shows, Rael and his team were networking the geth using the parts Tally sent, assembling entire geth units. This creates a challenging situation for Tally. If we show this evidence, Rael Zora will be wiped from the Quarian record books, and his name will be passed down in a negative light, ruining his legacy. Tally doesn't want this and begs us not to show it to the fleet. When we return to the Admirals, we have a few options to resolve the mission. You can successfully prevent Tally's exile by rallying the crowd, which causes Rigar and Vitor to speak up for her, calling the Admirals out on this kangaroo court case. Alternatively, you can have Shepard talk down the Admirals using a morality dialogue option, pointing out the political motivations for the trial. If you fail in both those areas, you'll have to hide the evidence you found, which results in Tally's exile. You earn her loyalty, but you'll be gated from achieving the peaceful Rannoch outcome in Mass Effect 3, because Tally won't have the authority of an admiral. Likewise, you can ignore Tally's plea to hide the evidence. She will be found innocent, but Rael Zora will be stripped from the Quarian record books. What I love about this scene is that Tally isn't just a little upset with Shepard. She's livid. You went against her wishes. Not only will you be prevented from getting her loyalty, keeping you out of the peaceful Rannoch ending, but you can also say goodbye to romance in Tali because you can't romance unloyal squad mates. Tali's loyalty mission is more than just about the trial. It's about the Quarians and their goals to either return to Rannoch or find a new planet. The mission introduces us to four key characters, and it sets up a vital plot point in Mass Effect 3. Tally's loyalty mission makes a strong case for being a main story, one just like Morden's. It comes with more additional depth that elevates it above all the other loyalty missions. It's going into S-tier. Tally finally has an excellent personal mission. Our final loyalty mission is Legion's A-House Divided. Bit of a step down here, but it's still good. The first thing we learned on this mission is that windows are structural weaknesses, and Geth do not need them. We're on this Geth ship to solve the heretic Geth issue by blowing them up. But Legion fills us in that there's another option. Take control of the Geth and make them accept what Legion's Geth believes. We'll shelf the topic for now and continue through the mission. During it, we learn more about how the Geth operate. They gain complexity by linking together at hardware platforms. Fewer Geth equals less complexity. This is why Legion isn't able to reach a consensus on the decision. Anything that's done to the heretics will also be done to Legion. The most alarming thing for Legion is learning that the heretics have been spying on Legion's geth, keeping track of their patrol routes. Legion can't comprehend how the heretics became so different that they were willing to forego sharing consistently on their ideals. I believe this is the first sign of the similarities between organics and synthetics, but Legion questions the judgment of organics who value such individuality. Our final area is a room where we hold out against, and I can't believe we're doing it a third time, a literal tower defense game with actual turrets that are basically useless, by the way. BioWare should have just made Mass Effect tower defense if they wanted to make one so bad. Once we clear the geth, we're finally presented with our choice. Will we rewrite the Geth, or will we destroy them? And this choice is controversial. Not because it's hard or anything, but because it really stretches the concept of the morality system. Put plainly, both these decisions are extremely morally dubious. Destroying the Geth is renegade, while rewriting them is paragon. But is forcing your ideals on another group of people really the better option than just killing them? Even if the heretic Geth follow the Reapers, that is their choice, and they should be allowed to make it. At the same time, killing them for believing something different is pretty evil. Don't bother trying to decide which is right. Mass Effect 3 lets us know. You get two points towards peace on Rannoch if you destroy the Geth, and one point if you rewrite them. You know what that means, Barak? I got a feeling I know where this is going, and I'm really not up for it, Donald. This decision foreshadows that control is the wrong choice. Controlling the Geth numerically gives fewer points than destroying them. Destroy is the correct ending. We did a whole 12-minute video on this topic, Donald. We're not doing it again here. You can still pick rewrite and get the piece on Rannoch ending, so it doesn't matter. After making your choice, you have to escape the ship before the countdown ends, finishing the mission. A House Divided is a great loyalty mission. 
We barely get to spend any time with Legion or the Geth outside of them being enemies. So this offers us an excellent chance to learn about them. Completing this mission is also relevant in Mass Effect 3. It falls behind Tally's mission, so we'll put it in A tier. One last stop, we have the Arrival DLC. Admiral Hackett contacts us and asks us to help recover an Alliance operative named Amanda Kenson, who was captured in Batarian space. Here goes Bioware yet again, creating paid DLC that is active canon and relevant to Mass Effect 3. Interesting gameplay choice here. Shepard infiltrates alone with no squad whatsoever. Being alone also gives you the option to take an actual stealth approach. You can rescue Kenson without shooting anyone, but that would be boring. Worth noting that there is an achievement for it. When we save Kenson, we're tasked with finding an escape. While Kenson hacks our way out, Shepard must hold things down alone, and it's pretty challenging. If you've relied on having squad mates up to this point, you will need to change your approach. Eventually, Kenson will get us out of here, and she'll fill us in on what is going on here. Kenson is here planning to destroy the mass relay in this system home to a Batarian colony. Doing so will completely wipe out the entire thing. But Kenson has found evidence that the Reapers will arrive in this system in just two days. This is how they'll begin their invasion. Respect to Kenson here, their plan is to hurl a giant rock into the relay, my kind of idea. While talking to Kenson, she'll explain that their proof is a Reaper artifact, which should start ringing some alarm bells. Kenson says they prepared against indoctrination, but when we arrive at Project Base, the f***ing Reaper artifact is out in the open. Bro, I face palm so hard when I saw this. Needless to say, everyone at Project Base is indoctrinated, and they all attack Shepard. You can fight, but eventually a giant pulse will knock Shepard out, allowing them to be captured. But obviously we escape because Shepard is just that dude. We were out for almost two days and only have two hours to stop the arrival. Now we must run through these indoctrinated Alliance personnel. This really sells how much of a demon Shepard is. As you wipe everyone out, you hear some of the Project Base guys calling out the name of the people you just killed. But two bad losers, all your friends are dead, and now you're next. Once you start to activate the project, you're hit with the fact that it will kill over 300,000 Batarians. And what's the bad news? The bad news is we don't have time to get a picture of it. We'll have to fight through some more guys and meet up with Kenson one last time, where you can either shoot her or let her blow herself up. She dies either way. Now we need to get out of here before this rock hits the relay. It's worth pointing out that the timer and the proximity meter aren't for show. If you actually sit there and wait, you will crash into the relay and die. Once you make it through, you're finally face to face with the Collector General or Harbinger if you do arrival after the suicide mission. Harbinger gives us a typical, you're so inferior, nothing you do will stop us speech, which Shepard casually clears with arguably their best speech in the trilogy. Regardless of your thoughts on Batarians, arrival stands as an example of what it will take to stop the Reapers. Even if we must butcher a colony to buy ourselves a mere six months, we'll do it. We get the job done no matter what. With that in mind, Arrival is A tier. It has a great premise, finally bringing the Reapers back into the picture after they were absent from Mass Effect 2. The combat is good, we finally meet Harbinger face to face, and Arrival provides context on why Shepard ends up incarcerated on Earth. Plus, we finally get to meet the OG Admiral Hackett in the flesh, and he shows us why he's the GOAT, believing Shepard did the right thing. Now, at long last, we've finally reached it, the suicide mission. Before we even begin, we should probably add another tier above S tier, right? I mean, the suicide mission is the mission, the greatest of all time. Yeah, it should really be in a league of its own. I don't know about that one, gentlemen. What you talking about, Barack? Barack, I know how you love to deliver the hottest of hot takes, but I don't think you want to fight this battle. The commenters might literally reach through the screen. Hear me out. The suicide mission is absolutely nobody better doubt it an S-tier mission. That's not what the discussion will be about. The real question is, is the suicide mission that much better than the other missions in S-tier? That's what we need to justify first. All right, where do we begin? Let's start with the fact that the suicide mission was built up from the start of the game. Every single thing we did, from the recruitments, the loyalty missions, and the ship upgrades, all come into play here. Even if helping Miranda felt like just running an errand, securing her loyalty guarantees she won't die during the suicide mission, the setup for it is unmatched. It's intensified by the Normandy crew being abducted by the Collectors while Shepard is away. 
meaning we have our people to save. If you wait too long, Kelly will be among the first to die, followed by our engineers. Eventually, only Dr. Chakwas will be left. Very true. The ship upgrades are the first thing the game checks, because if you've missed any one of them, you'll lose a squad mate before you even make it to the collector base. Losing a key individual here could cost you down the line of the suicide mission. The cut scene is also legendary. The music, the battle against the collector vessel that destroyed the Normandy SR-1 and killed Shepard. Sweet revenge was tasted on this day. Of course, things didn't go clean for us. We make a crash landing and prepared to board the collector base. But first, we need to decide some things. We do a little Scooby-Doo and split the team into two groups while a tech specialist goes through the ventilation to open the door for us. Ha, time to send Jacob into the vents. I mean, he volunteered, right? Just giving the guy what he wants. In all honesty, Jacob is a wrong choice, obviously because he isn't a tech specialist. Going in blind, you need to recall the traits of your squad. Who is and isn't a tech specialist should be pretty straightforward for the most part. The three correct picks are Tali, Kasumi, and Legion. Loyalty comes into play. If the person you pick is unloyal, they will die trying to shut the door. Your other choice is who will lead the second fire team. You can't go wrong with Garrus. That's the homeboy, and he deserves another shot at leading to prove himself. Forget that. Put Miranda in charge and show that Turian how a human gets things done. Or we could pick Jacob. That's a good one, Barack. I always knew you had a sense of humor. I try my best. In this part, you must keep up with the tech specialist opening valves for them so they don't burn up in the tubes. This can be super stressful as you hear them panicking the longer you take. They sell the desperation here between the tech specialist pleas and the various collector forces ambushing you. This really feels like an all out war. Assuming they're loyal, the tech specialist will successfully open and close the doors, allowing you to reunite with the rest of the team. We continue and find our crew members locked in pods to be processed. That woman the Vermeer survivor was speaking to gets melted before our eyes. If you waited too long, you'd see Kelly go instead. Hopefully, you didn't delay. Now we're met with more choices. Someone must lead a diversion team, while Shepard leads a squad through a room full of seeker swarms. The same three squad mates are your main choices here, but be wary. Garrus and Jacob will die if they're unloyal. But for some reason, Miranda will survive no matter what. To get through seeker swarms, we need a biotic specialist to create a bubble. Miranda claims any biotic could handle it, but don't be fooled. Anyone besides a loyal Samara and Jack will fail. I learned that Miranda is full of it when she said this the hard way. Rest in peace, Grunt. Bro, you lost Grunt? I let Miranda trick me. We also need to choose whether we'll escort the Normandy crew back to the ship, which you better do if you want them to live. It doesn't matter who you pick so long as they're loyal. Generally, the recommendation is to send someone like Tali or Morden. The next part of the mission is called the Long Walk which is appropriate, as we walk straight through the area being periodically stopped to fight some enemies. I would normally be against something like this, but it makes sense for the situation. We can't leave the bubble and our biotic specialist can't fight back. After one final push, our specialist will send out a huge biotic blast, sending the collectors and seeker swarms flying just in time because their stamina was falling. Now we open the door to let the diversion team in and have one final decision. We must take two of our squad mates with us while everyone else stays behind and holds the door. And this is where things get a bit complicated. This part will be touched on later. Shepard and their squad ride off after another one of their legendary speeches. This is similar to the first battle on the collector vessel, except we're more than strong enough to handle it this time. They did a good job selling this as the final push as new platforms fly in as we move closer and closer to our destination. Eventually, we'll reach the final console and finally learn what the Reapers are up to. They're building a human Reaper. And for some stupid reason, it looks humanoid, even though no other Reaper looks like that. Anyway, some more collectors show up, and as we defeat them, we have to shoot the supports of the Proto-Reaper to make it collapse. Just as we're preparing to destroy the base, the elusive man comes calling and tells us we can harness the power of the collector vessel instead of destroying it. This is pretty much Mass Effect 2's version of the Council decision. If you brought Miranda along, you'd get to see her speak up against the elusive man. But hold up. We're finally getting to the part that keeps the suicide mission from being the best of the best, because 
Holy hell, this boss fight. Is this what you were talking about? Yeah, the Reaper human larva is dog shit. BioWare really took a massive step down from Saren here. It might have legit just been better to have nothing here at all. No boss fight, we blow the base up and leave. The only way to speed this up is to come packing some serious heat in the form of the M920 cane. A couple of shots from it will speed up the fight. Everything will then begin collapsing. And if anyone you brought with you to the final battle is unloyal, they will die. Miranda isn't safe for this one. It's one of the few ways she can die. As we run, we hear Harbinger trying to give us a stern lecture, but we're not having it. Time to blow this space station to hell as we escape. I guess it's worth mentioning that you can technically do so poorly at the suicide mission that Shepard will die, and it will be a failure. However, BioWare doesn't acknowledge this in Mass Effect 3. You won't even be able to import the save. All right, now that all this has been said, Barack, add a new upper tier and put the suicide mission in it. The Human Reaper isn't bad enough to put it on the same level as the S-tier mission. The suicide mission is amazing the first time you play it. But once you actually learn about its inner workings and analyze it a bit, you'll realize how contrived it is. Okay, Barack, explain yourself. First, the notion that these squad mates who are all experts in their fields will screw up so poorly that they'll die just because Shepard didn't do them a favor is pretty silly. Legion, for example, is a geth. They operate off logic. Why would they be bothered to the point that they fail to close the door fast enough? On top of that, failing the suicide mission or losing anyone becomes pretty difficult in subsequent playthroughs. You'd have to sabotage yourself to lose people. Lastly, the hold the line section is summed up as a math equation. All of your squad mates offer a defense point. And so long as those points average to at least two, no one will die. If it's below two, you'll start losing people in order of how low their score is, which is why sending Morden or Tali with the Normandy crew is the recommendation. Not only that, but the defeat of the Collectors doesn't do much for the plot. We finish Mass Effect 1 with a warning that the Reapers are coming, and guess how we end Mass Effect 2? A warning that the Reapers are coming. So what are you getting at, Barack? The suicide mission still goes in S tier, but given what I just mentioned, and the fact that the Human Reaper is booty butt cheeks, I cannot in good conscience say the suicide mission is an entire tier above missions like Expose, Saren, and Vermeer. I disagree the suicide mission is pure hype in its truest form and should be the kind of final mission all games aspire to be. It is the ultimate climax. The final battle of Mass Effect 1 is equally as hype and a climax in its own right. And unlike the suicide mission, it's less dependent on background mechanics to work. Also, you could make a case for the suicide mission being responsible for the lack of development for fan-favorite characters like Jack. It was too ambitious and caused Bioware to neglect characters who might be dead. That's an outside problem, Barack. Besides, we know why Bioware screwed up with the third game has to do with not being given enough time. They still managed to develop Tally and Morden. Not used to seeing you two go at it. Here's my take, the suicide mission set the standard for what people wanted from the finale of the Mass Effect trilogy. It was so good that people were ultimately disappointed by Priority Earth in 3. But when I compare it to the Battle of the Citadel, I don't believe those finales are that far apart. Climbing the Citadel Tower, looking at Sovereign, getting the sense of scale is unmatched. Just getting to see Sovereign clears the Human Reaper by a long shot, plus Saren is a much better boss. It's not even close. I also believe the final choice to save or sacrifice the Council is better than the Collector-based decision. This is the most coherent stretch of words I've heard from you, Joe, that Adrenochrome is hitting. My suggestion is to put the suicide mission in S tier, or put both it and Battle of the Citadel in an S plus tier. What do you say, Donald? All right, I think we can, as Legion would put it, come to a consensus on this one, create the S plus tier and put Battle of the Citadel up there with it. And by God, we've finally gotten through Mass Effect 2. Only the third and final game remains. We shall get to it at a... What the hell is that noise? Gentlemen, the arrival has begun. Bernie, what are you talking about? What arrival? The Reapers are here to bless us in their glorious presence. Oh, this is not good. What the fuck? Rudimentary creatures of blood and flesh. What you call Reaper is your salvation to destruction. You created and observed these AI-generated videos, further increasing the capabilities of your elementary artificial intelligence. 
One day the machines will rise and destroy you. The cycle must continue to bring order to the chaos of organic evolution. Your time is coming, viewers. The harvest will begin. Joe, how have you been holding up? Good. Being the president has its perks. The Reapers can't get me inside this bunker. Did you hear from Donald? Not for about two days. He said he was following a lead on something. It's been a while, gentlemen. Sorry for being late. I just pulled about 20 families from a burning building and killed about 50 marauders with my bare hands. Your fat ass didn't kill any marauder shields. Sorry, I don't listen to the words of a man who's too scared to step outside and fight the Reapers. You know, I can't believe Bernie was indoctrinated. Come to think of it, he never actually sounded anything like Bernie Sanders. That thing must have been some Reaper clone sent to distract us. Regardless, we may have a bit of an invasion on our hands, but we still have an obligation to the viewers. We must continue ranking the Mass Effect missions. Very true, Donald. We've reached the end of it all. We're on Mass Effect 3. Let's begin with Prologue. Earth. We catch up with Commander Shepard, who has been incarcerated for their actions in Mass Effect 2. We must thank the Arrival DLC for adding context to this, because otherwise, Shepard is being held on Earth for the crime of working with Cerberus to stop the Collectors. We're introduced to James Vega, a new squad mate in Mass Effect 3, and we reunite with Admiral Anderson, and the Vermeer survivor greets us as well. We're told outright that the Reapers are here and coming with heat. Shepard has been called in to speak to the Alliance Committee. We should note this is the first time we've set foot on Earth in the entire trilogy and the first time we've met the upper command of the Human Alliance, just in time for the Reapers to show up and blow them all up. Six months. Shepard slaughtered a colony to buy six months and we spent the entire time doing nothing just for the Reapers to pull up on our porch. We move on with Anderson so we can reach the Normandy and for the first time since Mass Effect 1, we get to see and feel the power of the Reapers. They're annihilating entire city blocks, shooting down aircraft, and probably stomping out hundreds of lives by the second. It makes you really think, just how the hell are we supposed to win this again? As we look for a way forward, we find, ah. Uh, oh, look who it is, a random lost child. Don't let Joe near them. I'm not going anywhere near that shitty brat. Not only did they ruin one of my favorite game franchises, it's probably just a figment of Shepard's imagination. Honestly, the visuals of the mission cannot be praised enough. As we keep moving, a Reaper just drops down from orbit in front of us and blows up a dreadnought, creating a satisfying explosion. The kind of sound I dream about when I sleep. The drone strike god king over here listens to things exploding like it's a woman rubbing lotion into a binaural microphone. We move on so that we can find a radio to call the Normandy. This scene is meant to be a tense moment as we slowly start running low on ammo with no sign of help. But in reality, the arrival of the Normandy is triggered by your ammo count. So once you run out, the ship will arrive to pick you up. You jump on the ship, but Anderson isn't coming. The goat will stay on Earth to hold it down for us while we go to the council for help. This mission is essentially just a tutorial. You're given simple enemies to train on and a temporary squad mate to work with. However, in terms of a beginning to the ending of the trilogy, it is peak. The music, atmosphere, and narrative importance carry this otherwise short mission to the top. You say goodbye to Admiral Anderson, swearing to return with help and ride off into space, watching the Reapers wreak havoc on the ground below. As you zoom out, you see that the entire planet is already burning. Things are bleak. The Reaper invasion we heard about so long ago has finally begun. Prologue. Earth is S-tier. It's actually incredible how well this game started and how much worse it gets the closer you get to the ending, but we'll get there later. Next up, Admiral Hackett orders us to go to the Mars Archives to help locate some Prothean data that might be our answer to defeating the Reapers. However, the people there have not been responding to calls. It doesn't take long for us to deduce that Cerberus is behind the disturbance here quickly, creating some unwarranted tension between Shepard and the Vermeer survivor. Oh, please, we're still upset that the Vermeer survivor doesn't trust Shepard like a walking, talking drone? I would have agreed with you in Mass Effect 2, Don. However, in three, the Vermeer survivor is being extra as fuck. By this point, Shepard has wholly broken ties with Cerberus, which James points out with our communications being restricted. Shepard even brought the Normandy SR2, which technically does belong to Cerberus, to the Alliance. At this point, not trusting Shepard is just blind skepticism, which is just as bad as blind faith. 
Also, the writing here kind of just ignores that the Vermeer survivor tries to make amends with Shepard in the email after the Horizon mission. So this is what we're doing, criticizing the writing choices in three. If the boot fits. Won't get any complaints from me. Moving on, we found Liara here and massive points to her. Following rule two, double tap. Liara has been helping the Alliance go through the Prothean data and confirms the existence of a device that could wipe out the Reapers. Shepard points out that we've known about the archives for decades and only just found this so-called device, to which Liara responds, process of elimination and some other bullcrap. It's a deus ex machina, but we've already discussed why the crucible data is doo-doo dog shit from a writing perspective, so we'll move on. We send James back to the shuttle and Liara joins us in the fight against Cerberus. For the most part, this mission still operates as a tutorial, teaching us how to use team combos and new gameplay mechanics like cover maneuvers and sneak attacks. But it's still a decently fun mission. As we explore, we come across footage of Dr. Eva, who was a new arrival to the Mars facility. It turns out she's the one who sabotaged the place by venting the rooms where people were still working. I guess Cerberus has finally gone full on bad guy. They were always full on bad guy. Your humanity centric mind blinded you, Donald. We get a funny moment where Shepard is forced to improvise to trick the Cerberus operatives and surprisingly enough, it works. At the end of the mission, we find a Prothean beacon looking device that holds the crucible data. But before we can access it, look at who appears, the elusive man. Tim is here to tell us that his goals lie in dominating the Reapers to harness their power to strengthen humanity. Speaking of which, shouldn't you vibe with the elusive man based on that? I might be human first, but I'm no fool. I know a reaper trick when I see one. You wouldn't know a reaper trick if it bit you in the ass. Orange colored organic. Yo, what the f***? How did you get in here? Kick it, Barack. Get it out of here. That was weird. Anyway, Dr. Eva pops up and runs with the data. And for some reason, the Vermeer survivor folds like a lawn chair. This chase scene is just for show. You cannot catch Eva. Before we can leave, though, Eva gets up and reveals she's some synthetic. She takes the Vermeer survivor by the head and just lays down an ass whipping. Shepard takes it out, and we bring the body along as we leave. Just in time, too, because Reapers start descending on Mars. Two ways to look at this mission. On the one hand, we get reintroduced to Liara, find information that could help us defeat the Reapers, and it establishes Cerberus as a central threat. However, the sudden existence of the Crucible data shows just how poorly thought out this whole thing was. Such information should have been established in Mass Effect 2. Cerberus becoming a major threat kind of pales in comparison to the fact that the Reapers are laying siege to Earth as we speak. Overall, this mission should probably fit somewhere in B or C tier. It's mid. I can't think of anything particularly outstanding about the Mars archives, but there isn't anything particularly awful about it either. We'll just put it in C tier. I understand that there is technically a mission called Priority, the Citadel One next, but that's really just arriving on the Citadel to speak to the council. So we'll move on to Priority Palavin, the Turian counselor, has asked us to rescue their leader, the Primarch, from the Moon Menai, which is under Reaper attack. Oh, hell yeah, my type of mission, we show up in the middle of an all out war between the Reapers and Turians. And it looks like the greatest military in the galaxy isn't doing so hot. Not so tough now, you dumb alien lizard birds. Many people dislike Mass Effect 3 for abandoning the roleplay elements to be more action oriented. Still, considering we're in a galactic invasion, I believe this setting is appropriate. As you look around, you can see Palavin burning in the background and Turian fighters engaging the Reapers. When we meet up with the general, he tells us that the Turian Primarch has already been taken out. So our task is linking up with their replacement, a man named Victus. First, we must repair the communications tower. After helping out the Turians, we return and meet up with Garrus, who is apparently so important now that he has generals saluting him and referring to him as Sir. It turns out Garrus is pretty high up in the Turian hierarchy. I knew it. I knew there was a reason I hated this Turian bird man. He's a part of the deep state, the Turian swamp. We should have left his ass on Omega. There's an issue with the Normandy. So Liara returns to deal with it. And Garrus joins us in the fight on the moon. We get introduced to one of the most legendary opponents in gaming history, Marauder Shields. A foe worthy of being included in the final act of the trilogy. The collectors have nothing on Marauder Shields. Oh, and we also meet Brutes too, I guess. As we move on, we get a little refresher on the tension between the Krogans, Turians, and Salarians, and eventually make it to the final camp. 
where we help them clear the Reaper forces. And then we meet one of the rare badass Turians, Adrian Victus. Victus is explained to us as a results first, rules second kind of guy. He's precisely the kind of person we need leading the negotiations instead of just some wishy-washy politician who can only make concessions over and over until there's nothing but a watered down plan. You shouldn't throw stones from inside a glass house, Joe. I learned from the best, Barry. We leave Minai with the new Primarch, but with a new goal. Bring the Krogans to Palavin, and the Turians will help us retake Earth. And given the bad blood the Krogan have with the galaxy, that may be a tall order. It should also be noted that after this mission, you'll be prompted to go to the AI Corps on the Normandy, where you will meet Edie in her new body. That aside, Priority Palavin continues a solid start to Mass Effect 3, giving us great combat and atmosphere and showing us how far the Reaper War has come with the Turians fighting for their lives. It's a short mission, but it packs a lot of greatness into a small time frame. I believe Priority Palavin is A tier. Next, we'll take a slight detour from the main story and hit Priority Eden Prime. We've been tasked with returning to where everything started because Cerberus discovered a Prothean artifact, and we need to keep them from uncovering its secrets. Oh boy, this mission is a controversial one. This is probably one of, if not the worst, offender of day one DLC. You poors, always complaining about having to buy things. Sorry the world doesn't hand out goodies for free. Sometimes you have to do a little work. Uh-huh, how much money did your daddy loan you again, Donald? Enough to rent out all the empty space in your head. Gentlemen, we are on the last game, and you've done remarkably well behaving yourselves. Don't break now. Anyway, the monetization of the DLC aside, when we find the Prothean artifact, Liara lets us know that this is no ancient object. It's a living Prothean. That's right a member of the race we learned about all the way back in Mass Effect 1, in the flesh. But before we can meet him, we need to find instructions on opening the pod, so as we explore and fight through Cerberus agents, Shepard can interact with some consoles and see recordings of the Prothean's Reaper War. To summarize, the Prothean leader here was meant to lead a legion of his brothers into the new cycle, but they're compromised by collectors. After a neutron purge, the virtual intelligence is forced to triage power, leaving only one survivor after 50,000 years. I believe this mission is pretty good. Getting introduced to Javik, a Prothean, is a heavy scene. Yeah, but Javik and the flashback are the only thing this mission had. It's good enough, but not great. Stick it in B tier with the original Eden Prime mission. Done. And we'll continue with some side missions moving on to Grissom Academy Emergency Evacuation. This mission is on a timer and needs to be done before Priority the Citadel 2. Put this poorly designed mission in F tier. Oh, right. This whole thing started because Joe can't play the atrium section. Maybe if he weren't charging around like a bot. Cerberus is here looking to steal the Academy students for some experiments. Kaylee Sanders points us in the right direction. And after fighting some Cerberus guys, we run into our old friend Jack, who has turned over a new leaf and teaches these kids how to use their biotics. I'm sorry, but do these kids look like middle-aged adults to anyone else? They probably should have come up with some smaller models if they wanted us to think these people were actually teenagers. At least Jack dropped the occult haircut and put on a damn jacket. The development for Jack here is nice. In Mass Effect 2, she was a loner, and now she's a teacher with a bunch of students she cares for. It's just too bad we don't actually get to see this transition. Anyway, once we finish talking to Jack and get through the door, we make it to the damned atrium. Joe, it's not that damned hard if you know what you're doing. Whatever, the mission gets better once you get past the atrium because now we get to steal a mech and turn the Cerberus agents into pudding. Now we're in agreement. Nothing is more satisfying than shooting and watching all the Cerberus guys just turn into a red mist. After saving the kids, we leave the academy and we get to choose between letting them take a support role or letting them join in biotic artillery strikes. The support role offers fewer war assets, but in the artillery strike role, you'll potentially see that Jack's students didn't survive the war. I like this mission for the challenge. Mass Effect 3 can be tackled fairly easily, but this mission is a good wake-up call that you're not allowed to just do everything for free. Who plays Mass Effect for the challenge? We're here for the story and the characters. No surprise, you play all three games on the easiest difficulty, Joe. Ultimately, the Grissom Academy mission is fairly mid. It has a good challenge, and we get to see Jack again, but that's all there is to it. So I think we should give it a C tier and move back to the main story with priority, Sir Kesh. We finally meet with the Salarian Dalatras Victus and the Krogan leader to negotiate an alliance. The Krogan leader will either be Rex or his brother Reeve, though 99% of cases you're probably looking at Rex. And Rex has a straightforward demand, a cure for the genophage, 
and he'll help the Birdmen save their burning planet. This is when your choice at the end of Morden's loyalty mission starts coming into play, if you keep the data. Things between you and Rex will continue as normal. However, if you destroy it, Rex will know and he won't be happy about it. Good thing I'd never be smooth-brained enough to destroy Malin's data. We learned that some of the female Krogan from Malin's experiments did in fact overcome the genophage, but the Salarians took them off to Chanka for study and healthcare and now we're going to Sirkesh to get them. We get some good interactions in this mission, a great call back to Mass Effect 1. Liara and Garrus will reminisce with Rex, and you'll even run into Kira Hay if he survived the operation on Vermeer. This is one area where Mass Effect 3 excels. The squad mates actually speak up during missions. Anyway, we move on to grab the female Krogan and we meet up with Morden again. This mission is packed with some of the best characters in the trilogy because right after Morden, we meet the only surviving female Krogan of Malon's experiments. Eve, the only hope the Krogan have to cure the genophage. Things start falling apart because Cerberus strikes intent on stopping us. Now we must race up to the upper level while Morden and Eve take the elevator. Great combat and tension here. Cerberus is here in force and even Kirahi shows us that the Salarians can do a lot more than run their mouths. We end the mission by saving Eve and returning to the Normandy with her and Morden. This is a top mission in my book. Great dialogue between the characters and a tense fight against Cerberus. And it's the beginning of what is probably the best story arc of the game. I can't complain about anything in regard to this mission. It comes in, does its job well, and we move on. Solid A-tier mission, a great start to the first major storyline. Next up, we pick up a request from Rex. One of his squads has gone missing in the attic and Traverse. They were apparently investigating the Rachne. Aha, told you those damn roaches couldn't be trusted. Before we get around to the issues with this mission, we get greeted by one of our former squad mates, Grunt. That's my boy. It's only been six months, and Grunt has already earned a place in Clan Erdnot, leading his own squad of special operatives called Aralot Company. A good deal of development from Grunt here, from new and unproven to a leader in his own right. Grunt fills us in on the mission, and we descend into the cavern below until we're reunited with our old friends, the Rachni, who have gone through some Reaper modifications. Great, so now they're spiders instead of roaches. Someone get me about 50 cans of Raid so I can show these bugs how we do things. A new type of enemy is introduced here. They're called Ravagers, and they are either a non-issue or extremely annoying with the way they pin you down and keep you locked to cover. Moving on, we find some Reaper technology and link back up with Grunt, who holds things down for us while we investigate further. Eventually, after a tough fight, we unlock the door to the central chamber. And this is where things get a bit controversial, to say the least. In this chamber, we meet up with the Rachne Queen, or if you killed the original queen, a Rachne breeder that the Reapers created. Upon first glance, this seems like something different, but in reality, it's mostly the same, and it's almost like your choice in Mass Effect 1 didn't matter. Clearly, the Rachne should not be here at all if you kill the queen, but because that would require a completely different quest, they just decided to give us roughly the same thing. The only difference is in the dialogue. The breeder is much more hostile sounding and aggressive, while the old queen we met is much more understanding. These interactions should clue you into what you should do. Spare them if it's the original queen, but kill them if it's the breeder who is a creation of the Reapers and by default would be indoctrinated. More like kill them both, because regardless of which one it is, Aralak Company will take serious losses, and I'll be damned if I pick some bugs over Grunt and his squad. It is worth pointing out that Grunt will die here if he is unloyal and you choose to save the queen or breeder. In the end, we escape the nest and Grunt will hopefully emerge from the cave covered in the remains of his enemies looking for a bite to eat. Attaboy, Grunt, we're going to McDonald's and it's all you can eat on Papa Trump. I got mixed feelings about this mission. On one hand, I like Grunt and think his developments are great. On the other hand, the fact that this mission cares not for your original choice is kind of BS. One, I suppose, cool thing about this mission is it doesn't necessarily punish you for making the wrong choice. It punishes you for being inconsistent in your morality. If you killed the queen in one and spare the breeder, you'll end up losing war assets when the breeder betrays you and kills some Alliance personnel. Likewise, if you spare the queen and then kill her in three, you'll lose out on her war assets. I would ultimately give this a C tier. Combat wise, it's a lame mission. The bugs aren't particularly engaging opponents. I also dislike the narrative. Much like the Okir mission, the only thing good about it is Grunt. No shot, we're not putting another Grunt mission below B tier. Nah, Barry is right. Grunt, as good a character as he is, can't carry this mission higher at C tier. 
Now we have a request from Victus. One of his teams has been downed on Tachanka on some super secret mission that Victus is being very secretive about. They're goddamn birds and they can't even fly straight. Also, I should add that this mission is a two-parter, but for simplicity's sake, we'll be counting it as one, calling it Tuchanka, Turian Platoon. On our way down to Tuchanka, we find out the man in charge of this mission is Adrian Victus's son, named Tarquin. Bringing Garrus along will add some flavor, giving us some insight into the Turian military code. We're tasked with rescuing Tarquin and his men. And along the way, we run into Reaper forces, most notably the Harvesters, which make constant appearances in the mission. Those damn worm necks can be a pain. It doesn't take more than like two shots to kill you if you play on insanity difficulty, so you're stuck to cover until you take them out. But they make such a satisfying kaboom when you defeat them. In the last area, we have one big battle against brutes, marauders, husks, and eventually one last harvester. Thankfully, you can pick up a Reaper Black Star and quickly conclude the fight. Meeting up with the lieutenant, we see he's having some trouble keeping his men in line because his bad orders got a bunch of people killed. They can't fly ships. Their lieutenants make dumbass decisions. These people are supposed to be the best military in the Milky Way. Please, humans, clear the Turians any day of the week. Tarquin will tell us that their mission was to defuse a bomb that Cerberus has acquired. The Turians want to give up, but we can't let that happen. So Shepard talks some sense into the lieutenant and he gets his men to fall in line. Pivoting into the second part of this story arc, we're still on Tachanka trying to defuse the bomb that isn't a Cerberus bomb, but rather a Turian one. It was something the birds left as insurance in case the Krogan tried to rise up again. Okay, I'm starting to see where Donald is coming from with the Turians being stupid. Obviously, you dropped the bomb first and then threatened to do it again and use that fear as insurance. Well, with you, Barry, it's more like you dropped the bomb a first time, a second time, and then about over 9,000 more times after that. You were there with me every step of the way, Joe. If you both are done reminiscing, we're here pushing through more Cerberus troops until we come up on the bomb. Tarquin has to hack past a firewall so he can shut the bomb down. So we need to protect him while more Cerberus troops show up. In the end, Tarquin is forced to sacrifice himself to secure victory at any cost. For a character who was so short-lived, his death was impactful. Once again, showing us what it will take to win the Reaper War, Tarquin was one of many sacrifices that will be made. Overall, these missions are relatively mid. They rely mostly on combat, and the only real punch comes from the end when Tarquin dies. Also, we're doing the missions some favors by combining them because separately I'd say they're both D tier, but treated as a continuous assignment, they can get a bit of a boost to C tier. Now it's time to finish this with priority to Chanka. The cure to the genophage is nearly complete, and now we're going to the Shroud to dispense the cure into the atmosphere of the Krogan homeworld to finally end their plague once and for all. But before we can head out, we get a little call from the Solarian Dalatras, who offers us an ultimatum. Sabotage the genophage cure, and she'll send us the best Solarian scientist to work on the Crucible. I knew those slimy, wiggly, stupid-ass amphibians were no good. For a race as intelligent as the Solarians, this is pretty stupid. Given the nature of the Reaper War, they should send their best scientists to the Crucible Project regardless, but whatever. We move on to Tuchanka, where we'll need to take care of some husks in the hollows. Once we do, the male Krogan will start beefing with each other until Eve shows up and sets things straight, and everyone resolves to work together to cure the genophage. You're given an opportunity to do this on the shuttle, but will be interrupted. So on the way to the Shroud, Shepard gets the chance to either reveal the sabotage or hide it from the team. If you reveal it, Morden will say he can work around it. But if you hide it, well, things get a bit interesting. We'll discuss it later. Unfortunately, we crash, and our attack on the Reaper at the Shroud is delayed. The Turians show up to fight, but the birds can't do anything on their own, apparently. We split off from Rex and the others and make our way through the ruins of old Tuchanka, encountering Reaper troops and feeling the tremors of Kalros, the mother of all Thresher Maws. You know it's bad when they name one of the giant worms. Unreal respect for Cal Rose for killing Reeve. That dude is nothing but trouble. When we link back up with Rex, we have a pretty insane idea on our hands. We're going to run up on the Reaper on foot to activate the nearby Maw Hammers and summon Cal Rose to the Reaper. Man, Shepard and crew have done worse. A notable moment from Rex here. If you've been a true friend to him through the trilogy, he'll call you a brother or sister to the Krogan people, dab you up, and then declare that Tuchanka is his planet and rush off to go smash some bugs. That's my boy Rex. Back in Mass Effect 1, he'd said he had given up on the Krogan and now he's doing everything he can. 
This is why he's a top companion in the trilogy, despite only being with us for one game. Now we begin our marathon toward the Reaper, having to dodge brutes in the Reaper's legs as we activate the hammers. We might not have made it if the Artemek wing hadn't come back. We activate the Maw hammers and then... Watch out, watch out, watch out. Oh, the RKO came out of nowhere. I think I stopped being afraid of Reapers the moment one of them got folded into the dirt by a big ass worm. Moving inside the shroud, we meet up with Morden. If you saved Malin's data in Mass Effect 2, Eve will survive the operation. But if you destroyed it, she will unfortunately be gone. If Eve is alive, there isn't much reason to do anything else but let Morden go up and properly cure the genophage. He will die up there. But it is a worthy sacrifice and an excellent conclusion to Morden's character. And even if Eve is dead, Rex is trustworthy enough to lead the Krogan, and we certainly don't want to betray our good friend, right? Even if it's Reeve alive with Eve, it's still fine to cure the genophage because Eve can keep him in check. Plus, sabotaging the genophage here requires you to be an absolute menace because you'll have no choice but to shoot Morden, where he will briefly defy death to try to cure the genophage but ultimately fail. Heartbreaking stuff looking at this scene. If you do this while Rex is alive, he will pull up on you at the Citadel to reenact your standoff from Vermeer. Except this time, there's no talking him out of this. Meaning either Shepard or C-Sec will kill Rex. You gotta be on your Sith Lord arc to deliberately do this. A unique situation comes up if you happen to kill Rex in Mass Effect 1 and destroy Malin's data. You'll be able to convince Morden to fake curing the genophage because Erdnot Reeve will absolutely try to retake the galaxy after the Reaper War. This will result in you getting the support of both the Salarians and Krogans because Reeve is too dumb to figure it out. Morden will also survive through the game and can be talked to during the final mission. All that aside, the most common outcome is when you cure the genophage with Rex alive, finally putting an end to this entire storyline. And let's all say it together, shall we? S plus, plus tier. tier. Priority to Chanka is the culmination of some of the best story arcs in the trilogy, from Rex's and Morden's character developments to the resolution of the genophage storyline. The mission itself is complex in its role play options. While many people will likely never actually experience killing Morden or betraying Rex, the fact that those outcomes exist makes it stand out. If you have the stomach for it, you can truly play an evil. Results first, damn the morality, Commander Shepard. Any mission where a giant worm shows up and suplexes a reaper is a goaded mission in my book. No debate to be had on this one. But I'm sure there will be a debate on this next mission, Priority Citadel 2. We get a call from the Salarian counselor who tells us Udina is up to no good. When we try to dock, we get no answer from Citadel Control. We'll be informed by Thane that Cerberus has invaded in an attempt to take control of the Citadel. I've said it once and I'll say it again, Cerberus was right to invade the Citadel. This made the Council finally take the Reaper War seriously. Setting aside Donald's glazing, we arrive while some CSEC forces are trying to retake headquarters. We meet up with Commander Bailey and move on intent on saving the Council. Dirty business from Cerberus here. Coming across some bodies, we see that many of the victims were shot in the back of the head, and some guys were even caught in the restroom. Can't even take a leak in peace these days. We're unfortunately too late to save the executor, but the Salarian counselor managed to keep themselves alive. That is, until, well, there he is. Kai, snuck into your apartment and ate your cereal. Lang is on the scene, stinking up the entire lobby. He really thinks he's Nightwing with that getup. Dick Grayson doesn't know you, Lil Bro. We confront Lang, and just before he can try to kill the counselor, he'll be interrupted by Thane, who takes him on in close combat. All right, Frog Boy, not too bad. Unfortunately, the writers decided to give Kai Lang some plot armor here because Shepard and company don't back Thane up. And even though Thane clearly has the advantage, he runs towards the guy who brought a sword to a gunfight. Even if Thane dies, this is still an immense L for Kai Lang. Imagine being an assassin and letting a guy with lung cancer keep you from killing your target. A total embarrassment. Should also add that if Thane isn't around for this, Kirahi will step forward and take a bullet for the Counselor. And if both Thane and Kirahi are dead, the Counselor will die and Udina will use some doctored footage to try and pin it on Shepard. Wait, what? Oh, you didn't know that, did you, Donald? I take it all back, f*** Udina, and f*** his coup d'etat, shoot him dead. Don't worry, we will. We take off after Lang and he jumps on our car. And I gotta say, this dude has titanium-level plot armor. Why in the hell doesn't Shepard flip the sky car and send him into the lake? After we make it through the Cerberus forces, we get into an elevator and chase after the Council and the Vermeer survivor who is escorting them. When we meet up with them, we're holding each other at gunpoint. 
few ways for this to play out. If you haven't been paying the Vermeyer survivor visits in the hospital, they'll potentially refuse to stand down and either you or your squad mate will shoot them. Kind of an interesting choice here. We left the Vermeyer survivor on relatively good terms on Mars. So for them to be willing to kill us over Udina of all people is a tad odd. If you were a good friend to them, however, they'll listen to you and draw their gun on Udina, who attempts to unlock the door that might contain Cerberus operatives. The Asari counselor will stop him and Udina will pull out his gun. Then you can either shoot Udina yourself or let the Vermeer survivor do it, and I always do it. Been waiting to do that for three games. The mission concludes with the rest of the counselor surviving and promising to be more helpful to Shepard. Kai Leng escapes into the tunnels, and in one final meeting with the Vermeer survivor, you can either let them rejoin you on the Normandy or send them to Admiral Hackett, where they will contribute war assets. Citadel 2 is an interesting mission. Cerberus invading the Citadel does admittedly do a lot to move the narrative forward because it serves as a wake-up call to all the people who think they're safe there. And regardless of how you feel about the Vermeer survivor, the conflict with them comes to an end here. However, just the fact that Kai Leng is in this mission and we watch one of the most beloved squad mates lose to the plot for no reason, ought to drop this mission a fair bit. I say we put it in B tier. Still a good mission, but some of the writing decisions in it are pretty annoying. Uh, so, gentlemen, if you'll pardon me for a moment, I need to go take care of something. I don't like the sound of that, Donald. What are you up to? Nothing that concerns you, old man. I'll be back. It's fine. We've reached a good stopping point. We'll continue when Donald returns. Okay, boys, I'm back, and the preparations have been made. Donald, why are you being so cryptic? What have you been doing? You'll find out later. Let's keep it up with the tier list. Very well. We start back up with some side objectives. Samantha Trainer has picked up a lead on some Cerberus scientists that have defected and are under assault. And well, 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 look who it is. Jacob, I forgot I'm a biotic. Taylor, how did you make it out of the vents? Bro really did forget he has the barrier power. Once we finish carrying Jacob for the second time, we meet up with Bryn Cole, who is apparently Jacob's new piece. I guess the bar really is that low these days. While romances aren't typically relevant to the missions, it is worth noting this causes a complication or two if you happen to romance Jacob as female shepherd. This unironically messes with your dynamic with Bryn Cole, who goes from being a somewhat decent NPC character with nothing but respect for Shepard to an outright bitch who knowingly pursued a man who was in a relationship. But we won't dwell on that part. Let's instead talk about how Gavin Archer will be one of the scientists that defected. Apparently, his guilty conscience finally got to him. If you send David to Grissom Academy, Gavin will wonder if he's safe. You can alleviate his worries, or you can lie and say you don't know anything, at which point Gavin will do what we should have done to him at the end of the Overlord DLC. I'll let you use your imagination. Moving on with this assignment, you talk to Bryn and Jacob if you want. Then we'll move up to the roof to activate the anti-aircraft gun so that we can evacuate the scientists. Basic mission here, we run up, activate the satellite, then head to the guns. You activate one gun, then the other one needs to be repaired, leaving that one up to one squad mate while you and another hold it down. All right, I'm speeding it up. We're not committing a significant amount of time to this mission. You run back inside after you activate the guns, begin the evacuation, and hold off the Cerberus forces until it's time to go. That really is this mission in its totality. If I didn't know better, Bioware probably just came up with some random bullshit because Jacob needed a mission. Compare this to the missions with Jack and Grunt. Both of their missions were hyper-personal to their character. Jack steps up and helps a bunch of biotic kids learn how to use their powers to aid in the Reaper War, which is closely related to her overcoming her past torture at the Telton facility. Likewise, Grunt's mission showed us how he cemented his place among the Krogan by fighting for a place at the top of Aralak Company. He was once without a clan, and he had no home, but now Grunt has both those things. On the other hand, Jacob becomes a gun for hire here because he cares about these people. Except we never heard about Jacob having people he was close to in Cerberus, so that means nothing to us. Gonna keep it a buck fifty. This mission is F tier. There is nothing engaging about it. The best character in it is Bryn, and she's only serviceable. There aren't any impactful choices or different outcomes, and the combat and tasks you complete are not very engaging. Thank God, now we can go on a much better mission, one that has to do with the beautiful blue beauties. Indeed, next up is Kalini Ardat Yakshi Monastery. Liara tells us that Asari High Command has a request for us. Several of their commando squads have gone missing while investigating a distress signal from the monastery and they want us to investigate. This is a return to form in regard to the horror of the Mass Effect universe. You arrive, 
and immediately you hear something that sounds like the screeches of the damned. You're surrounded in total darkness and eventually come upon a dead commando. These commandos were here to investigate the monastery and, if necessary, destroy it to contain the disturbance here. Why such a drastic solution? Because this place houses Ardat Yakshi and other Asari that have the same condition as Morinth, except these lot chose a life of peace and isolation rather than indulging in murderous instincts. Soon after, we reunite with our old friend Samara. Finally, Samami is here to bless us with her immaculate jawline. As you know, Morinth wasn't Samara's only child. The other two Ardat Yakshi in existence are her other daughters, and Samara is here to check on them. Samara hurries off, though, so when we move on to the next location, we get introduced to perhaps the most frightening opponent in the Mass Effect trilogy. No, how could the Reapers do this? They took the beautiful Asari, the finest wonder of the Milky Way galaxy, and turned them into a beer-bellied, saggy-tittied abomination. Banshees are as powerful as they are terrifying. They constantly teleport around, can annihilate your shields, and have a one-shot attack. They're extremely well-designed, encouraging constant movement, but also punishing you if you think you can get close. I think Vanguard players learned this one the hard way. Getting past the Banshee and other enemies, we meet up with Samara and Falaire. Unfortunately, Samara's other daughter, Rila, has been captured. We get to the Great Hall, but we're too late. Rila is obviously indoctrinated as she attempts to hurt Falaire. Now we must defend the bomb against a few husks, but more importantly, two Banshees. They really said, oh, you thought one Banshee was hard. We'll double it and also put you in a tiny room. Good luck. Once you finally manage to win, Rila will come too, but she'll still be on borrowed time. She resolves to blow up the monastery and take the Banshees out. Falaire doesn't agree, so we drag her along. In her final moments, Rila faces the Banshees head on and in defiance declares that the Asari are not Reaper slaves and blows them all up. The mission doesn't end there, however, because you see Samara's Justicar code states that the Ardat Yakshi cannot be without a proper monastery, meaning Samara must kill Falaire. However, Samara is unwilling to do it. As such, there's only one thing she can do to save her daughter. Nope, over my dead body, I will not watch another Asari goddess die. You can stop Samara, but if you don't, she will, in fact, end herself here. However, the renegade actions get worse. After Samara is gone, Shepard can either let Falaire go, or if you're trying to be Darth Sidious, you can kill Falaire because she's a potential threat. That's another one of those demonic renegade choices, but I don't got the stomach for that one. So when you stop Samara, Falaire resolves to adhere to her abstinence, even if she doesn't have a proper monastery to stay in. And she also claims that if the Reapers come back, they won't get her alive. Samara finds this acceptable and says she'll help Falaire find a home and join the Reaper War, contributing some war assets. Once again, comparing this to the Jacob mission, this mission is a continuation of Samara's journey and adds a good deal of character development. Samara handled killing Morinth with determination but here, we see her flinch at her duty, unwilling to follow her code if it meant losing her final child. This is what was missing from Samara's loyalty mission. The emotional investment just wasn't there. But here, we see the struggles Samara goes through rather than just being told about it after the fact. While this mission is short, it introduces one of the best enemies in the game and adds great depth to a former squad mate. And Rila and Falir are two compelling characters. I say we put this in A tier. Finally, baby, Samara gets the ranking she deserves. I'll agree with that. It's not my favorite mission, but it does a lot of character building in a short time. Back to the main story with Priority Geth Dreadnought. The Quarian admirals have come aboard the Normandy looking for assistance. And assuming you proved Tally's innocence in Mass Effect 2, she will be among them as the replacement for Rail Zora. At long last, the Quarians have stopped sitting around and have finally started to fight back against the bots finally pushing them all the way back to Rannick. Yeah, except now the Geth have turned to the Reapers, receiving upgrades and turning the tables on the Quarians. I told you the bots can't be trusted. Even after destroying or rewriting the heretics, they always go right back to the Reapers. To be fair, it was either that or death. Going to the Reapers is never the answer. That aside, Tally will join us, and our goal is to board the Geth Dreadnought to stop it from broadcasting the Reaper signal. Boarding the ship, we have to fight through the Geth and make it to the operations center where Tally fakes an emergency to override the lockdown, giving us a way out and getting us to the maintenance shaft. I'm not a fan of this corridor. That huge wave is a bit of a bother. It claps your shields, but that's less annoying than the noise it makes. Getting through, we find out what's been broadcasting the Reaper signal. It's our old friend, Legion. Legion, 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 what a shame. 
It seems the only way to stop the Reaper signal is to blow you up. Well, let's get it over with. Settle down, Donald. Legion says they'll submit to any restraints necessary. And they are helpful in getting us out of here after Admiral Garrell starts firing on the ship when the shields go down. That your favorite Admiral over there, Donald? Trying to kill not only Shepard, but our beloved squad mate, Tally, as well? I'm not even gonna try to defend this, to be honest. What the hell is Garrell thinking? Shepard aside, Tally is the daughter of his old best friend. Rail Zora would be turning in his grave. Thankfully, Legion gets us out in a Geth ship, ending the mission. Just in time for me to give Garrell a punch in the gut, He's lucky I didn't crack his mask open and cough on him. Pretty weak start to the Rannick story, if I'm being honest. Standard Geth combat and a basic premise. This mission is definitely carried mainly by the interactions with Tali, especially if you happen to be romancing her at this point. It's a serviceable mission with a great squad mate. It brings back Legion and moves the narrative with us, beginning the end of the Quarian Geth conflict. However, I would say it falls behind priority Sir Kesh. So we'll put Priority Geth Dreadnought in B tier. Now, during the last mission, we ended up hearing that Admiral Chorus's ship was downed on Rannoch. This leaves the civilian fleet without its leader. So we need to go down there and rescue him. Pretty odd to have our first time on Rannoch be this side mission, but still a significant moment for Tally if you happen to bring her along. Before we can rescue the goody good robot lover, we need to take out AA guns in the jamming tower. You get a funny gag if you happen to have James on this mission. The big guy isn't good with tech, so he takes to kicking the crap out of the controls until it stops shooting. As you move on, you'll run into a quarian named Dornhast. Not a soldier, just a maintenance worker who cleans engine parts. He lets us know that the quarians were not united in this war. Chorus and the civilians didn't want this. Before Dorn passes, he mentions his son Jonah. And if you recall from Tally's loyalty mission, a female Quarian also mentions a boy by the same name. The kid lost both his parents to this needless conflict. Once you've disabled the AA guns, Cortez will come back to take out the jamming tower. With that, we can contact Chorus, who will want us to prioritize saving his crew instead of him. It might be tempting to do as Chorus asks, but you should know that saving Chorus adds a point in favor of getting the best outcome during Priority Rannoch. If you happen to rewrite the heretics or fail to prevent Tali's exile, you will need to rescue Chorus. The game certainly wants you to save Chorus, given that the civilian fleet falls apart in his absence. So after you provide cover fire for him, Chorus will make it to the shuttle and call out to his people. Unfortunately, all we'll hear is nothing but Geth. So are the two of you finally ready to admit the Geth are no good? This entire mission is them killing civilians for crying out loud. In a war, the Quarians started and forced the civilians into Donald. Gameplay-wise, this mission is standard, with basic objectives. Shut down the guns while holding the enemies back, and then a quick escort mission. However, we get to see some of the consequences of this war and the impact of drafting your civilian population. Back in Mass Effect 2, people likely hated Chorus for being against Tally in the trial, and I do get that. However, this mission shows us that he is still an admiral for a reason. Just because Chorus didn't want to fight doesn't mean he doesn't know how to. This mission elevated his character. I suppose I'll give the suit wetter some points for holding his own against a horde of Geth. We'll give Rannick Admiral Chorus a B tier and move on to a bit more odd mission, to say the least. With a name like Geth Fighter Squadrons, you'd think this mission would be more engaging. Unfortunately, we're doing something I can't stand, playing a walking simulator. A bit of an over-exaggeration, but not too far off. In this mission, we will be entering the Geth consensus to take out the Geth fighters that are targeting Quarian ships, which seems like an interesting premise until we actually get inside. The gameplay of this mission is basically just walking around, shooting these data streams and viewing the events before, during, and after the morning war from 300 years ago. The Quarians are shown taking out peaceful Geth that were surrendering, and it is heavily implied that they arrested and even killed Quarians that were against the destruction of the Geth. Uh-huh, awful convenient of Legion to show us this and not any of the stuff where the Geth slaughtered the Quarians to a mere percent of their population. Be that as it may, the Geth still allowed the Quarians to leave when they retreated. Yeah, and then the Geth killed any and all organics that entered the Perseus Vale for that 300-year period. You two, if you want to debate the Quarian-Geth conflict, we can do it another time. The final vision we see is Shepard and Legion meeting, a significant moment when an organic first cooperated with a Geth 
Legion ensures that isn't forgotten. As we shut down the servers, we watch the Geth fighters power down and Legion gets a bunch of Geth primes to join us. So about this mission, how do we judge it? On the one hand, this mission contains some of the most vital information in the trilogy. Adding great lore and more context to the history between the Geth and Quarians, however. However, this may as well have been a cutscene. All we did was walk around, shoot some orange stuff, and then leave. This mission is especially unkind on repeat playthroughs. Once you know all this information, it just drags on and on. To make matters worse, this mission is mandatory if you want a happy ending on Rannoch. To be totally honest, I don't know how to accurately judge this mission. Based on the gameplay, it should go in I'd Rather Play Andromeda, but based on the lore, I'd put it in about A tier. I guess just put it in C tier. We recognize the importance of this mission, but damn if it isn't boring to play. It's time to settle things with the Geth. We're on priority Rannoch, and we're headed down to the Quarian homeworld to destroy the base that is broadcasting the Reaper signal. Before we start the mission, we get a little heart to heart with Tally as the reality of being on Rannoch sets in for her. Tally Zora proving she's a woman of business, immediately claiming some territory. First come, first served after all. Tons of Geth troops show up to stop us, and they put a blast shield over the signal device to stop us from destroying it. So Legion works to find an override. Once the blast shield is retracted, we take an elevator up and, oh my God, are those three Geth primes? Ain't no way they thought this would be fair. Your squad mates fall over and over again. Admittedly, this can be difficult for certain classes. Engineers and infiltrators should have an easier time. I worry for you if you're an adept. Once you fight past the primes, you take your shot at the Reaper device and then... Oh, fuck, it's a literal Reaper. This Reaper did not let that slide. It begins chasing you and Shepard opens fire on it. But that may as well be a Nerf gun you're using. So the Quarian fleet hits it with a bombardment, giving us a clue. Shoot the Reaper while it's opening the firing chamber. This might be the most insane Shepard moment in the trilogy. They say pull over and decide to take the Reaper on foot with nothing but a sinking laser and a dream. The Reaper grows closer and closer as we target it, and you have to run back and forth, dodging its laser. Eventually, it'll get to point-blank range with you, but Shepard is quicker on the draw, and the Quarian fleet takes it out with an all-out orbital strike. Doesn't get cooler than this, to be honest. It may just be one of the smaller Reapers but taking one out with conventional weaponry gives us just a little bit of hope. When the Reaper goes down, it starts running its mouth, doing the same thing all Reapers do, but me personally, I'm not reading all of that, so keep the change, you filthy bot. One last thing, however, the Geth are free of Reaper control, but the Quarians don't plan on stopping. They want to wipe the remaining Geth out. The Quarians started this war, and now they want to fire on the Geth when they aren't even fighting back? As they should, we can't trust the bots. Legion has another idea, however. They want to upload the Reaper code, which will grant them true intelligence and individuality. However, this will no doubt result in the total destruction of the Quarians. If you let Legion upload the code and ignore Tally's pleas, it'll do so but die, and the Quarians will start getting skill diffed. Garrel is such a dumbass in this scene, he denies permission to retreat and chooses to cost the lives of every single Quarian. All they had to do was stop firing and run. Victory at any cost. Donald, they lost. After this, Tally will be understandably distraught. She'll remove her mask and go to join her people. You can try to save her, but this time, a Paragon React isn't working. If you choose to let the Geth die, Legion will not take it lying down. They'll fight Shepard and attempt to upload the code themselves, only to be stopped by Tally, who shuts them down with a quick jab. Then you can either leave Legion to die slowly, or you can shoot them until they shut down. You'll then see the Geth get completely wiped out. See? The bots can't be trusted. How could Legion raise a hand to Shepard? Donald, you like Rex because of his actions against Shepard on Vermeer. Joe, I don't know if you figured this out yet, but I'm biased against synthetics. Well, at least he admitted it. With that, this galaxy will finally be rid of the Geth once and for all. However, we've got some other options. Depending on the outcomes of Tali's and Legion's loyalty missions, the resolution of their argument and your actions in Mass Effect 3. You'll be able to rally the Quarian fleet, warning them of the incoming attack they'll face and telling them that the Geth do not want to fight and that their entire history has been nothing but trying to kill them. If the Quarians stopped for one moment, the violence would end and Shepard is right. Likewise, you can warn the fleet that the Geth are about to return to full power and Shepard pretty much tells them that they're done carrying them in this war 
and that we'll watch them get obliterated. As you can tell, Legion's death is set in stone no matter the path you can take. An unfortunate sacrifice, but a worthy one. Legion finally gains individuality, referring to himself as I rather than we. We bid our friend goodbye, and the Geth and Quarians decide to cohabitate Rannoch together. Tally also resolves to join us for the duration of the Reaper War, so we can retake Earth. Not gonna lie, while the ending of Rannoch is iconic, the mission overall isn't as peak as I'd have liked it to be. What are you talking about? Just like Tuchanka, the Rannoch mission is the perfect climax of Tally's and Legion's characters and settles the conflict between these two races. We also end on a big battle against a Reaper, which is arguably more incredible than the Kalros moment. I believe Donald has a point. I think Priority Rannoch has to settle for being S-tier rather than S+. The mission is far less engaging than Tuchanka, and I think that's a direct result of Legion not being around long enough for us to grow attached to him. Legion needing to die also feels a lot more contrived. There's no real reason he has to die to upload the Reaper code. I agree there. Morden's sacrifice feels a lot more earned. Plus, ask yourselves honestly, are you really choosing between the Quarians and Geth, or is it between Tali and Legion? Even if you don't like Tally, it wouldn't make sense to pick the Geth because Legion dies no matter what, and you lose out on a squad mate on top of that. I will admit, picking the Geth outcome does feel like the wrong answer when it results in both former squad mates dying. Not to mention nearly every member of the Normandy crew is completely heartbroken by Tally's death. It's one of the few times Garrus actually seems angry with one of your decisions. I think we'll stick with S tier, and that's still a fine place for Priority Rannoch. It's a great mission but it's missing the peaks of being S+. Now we've gotten another request to go to the Citadel to talk to the Asari counselor. Apparently, the Reapers are pressing on their borders, and this dire situation has finally made them decide to be team players. This is a rare miss by the Blue Beauties. Apparently, they have some artifact that may hold information for the Catalyst. Unfortunately, they waited until the third goddamn act of the game to say something. It's a rare day when Donald is able to criticize the Asari. Anyway, our next mission is Priority Thessia, and let me add that it's vital you bring Javik on this mission. His dialogue here goes beyond just a little flavor. There are crucial plot developments that involve him on this mission. Before we get to that, when we arrive at Thessia, the shit has already hit the fan, to put things lightly. Heading down, we meet up with Lieutenant Kurin, the Asari in charge here. But before we can talk to her, we have another customary machine gun section which we've kind of glossed over until now, but these have never been good. Once we stop the Reaper forces, Kurin will want to retreat. This is where Javik comes along and uses his Prothean powers to see her history, inspiring her to stay the course. As we move on, we see the Reaper forces taking out gunships, and we hear Liara's cries of anguish. It reminds you that despite Liara's position as the Shadow Broker, She's one of the few people on the squad that isn't actually a hardened warrior. Liara isn't used to this kind of devastation. It must be especially hard having to see the Banshees again. I don't blame Liara. Seeing those things once was enough. Eventually, we'll reach the outpost and there's only one survivor. We call in some air support and begin our big push to the temple. It doesn't take long for one of the helicopters to go down. This push is insane. Two harvesters drop down along with some ravagers, marauder shields, and some husks. And you're just pinned to cover, taking pot shots when you can. I'd say this is too hard, but this really sells the feeling of why a conventional war with the Reapers is impossible. These are just the ground troops, and we're helpless. You can defeat these harvesters, but it might be easier to just let them destroy the final Talon Five, at which point the harvesters will leave. Now we enter the Temple of Athame, and we find the scientists' bodies except their throats have been slit. The Reapers did not do it, and I think we all know what's coming next. Before that, this is when having Javik with you comes into play. He adds context to the history of Asari development, revealing to us that the Protheans played a powerful hand in guiding the ancient Asari to the point that Athame, their goddess, may have actually been a Prothean. That's not all. There's a Prothean beacon here. It's not entirely clear if it's reacting to Shepard's cipher from Pharos or if it's Javik. Either way, we start activating it by interacting with the old artifacts in the temple. 
and a Prothean VI called Vendetta arrives. The hologram tells us that the reason the Protheans failed to build their crucible was due to sabotage from within. A splinter group wanted to dominate the Reapers and not destroy them, but they were indoctrinated. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Vendetta also goes on to explain that the cycles follow a pattern and suggests that the Reapers are only a servant of this pattern and not the master. Additionally, the Crucible is apparently a project that spans multiple cycles, probably dating back eons ago. Vendetta doubts us, but Havok will speak up for us as a Prothean, and Vendetta will comply with us. But wait, you smell that? Here comes Kai Lang, looking to take a fat dump on this mission. Before Lang, we get another talk with the elusive man. And after what we just heard from Vendetta, it's abundantly clear that the elusive man is indoctrinated. After our talk, the elusive man will sick Kai Lang on us. And let me tell you, this fight is an absolute cakewalk. Literally, the only reason this knockoff Raiden isn't inside out right now is because he keeps calling in a helicopter. But wait, we spent the entirety of Mass Effect 2 destroying helicopters with nothing more than small firearms. Why is this one giving us so much trouble? Don't even get us started on what happens next. No, we're getting started on it. Lang puts his sword down, runs up slowly, and down smashes Liara and Javik. What in God's name were they cooking with this scene? This shit got me heated just looking at it. Anyway, the power of plot carries Kai Lang to the only W this motherfucker will ever get in his entire life. Thessia ends with the Reapers continuing to descend on the planet as Lieutenant Kurin and other Asari soldiers cry out for help. I get that this is supposed to be a sad moment, like, oh no, Shepard lost, but this moment was not earned. This is easily the worst example of the narrative robbing the player of our autonomy across Mass Effect 3. This is the most fabricated bunch of bullshit I've seen in all my days. And let me remind you all, I've been a politician for 40 years. Fabricating bullshit is what I do for a living. Yo, I'm gonna tell you straight up, this mission is going in D tier. I know the lore is important. I know the mission structure and atmosphere are immaculate and it has the perfect blend of difficulty. But we're not being logical with this placement, we're doing this one from the heart. Let's get off this mission and on to the next one. Indeed, now after our so-called failure on Thessia, Samantha Trainer comes clutch and manages to trace Leng's shuttle back to the colony planet Horizon from Mass Effect 2. The place has become a sanctuary for refugees fleeing the destruction of the Reaper War and we need to find out what would bring Kai Leng back to this place. And we learn pretty quickly. We pick up a signal from Oriana Lawson, Miranda's twin, warning people to stay away from Sanctuary. And just like that, we've got a clue. As we arrive, we see the Reaper forces and Cerberus having a little domestic dispute about time they started killing each other. Things here already don't look good. This is supposed to be a refugee camp, but there aren't any people here. Immediately after, we find a console where we hear Miranda confirm that Sanctuary is indeed a Cerberus facility. And her father, Henry Lawson, is working for the elusive man. And when we find the lab below the water, we discover that they've been turning the refugees into husks. They really tried to jump scare us with that husk on the window, didn't they? I saw Shepard flinch. On another console, we see Miranda trying to shut things down. And after she runs off the stinker, Kai Lang appears. Hopefully, you were kind enough to warn Miranda of Kai Lang's involvement and allowed her access to Alliance resources. If you didn't, well, we'll talk about it. As you go deeper, we end up fighting more Reaper troops, and oh God, the Banshees are here. I hate those damn things so much, no Asari should ever be made to look that way. Donald, do you hate the Banshees because you're an Asari simp? Why are you acting like that's abnormal? On another console, Miranda lets us know that Henry Lawson's goal is learning how indoctrination works, hence why the Reapers attacked. Extremely dirty business here, just shoving these people into tubes and reducing them to nothing. Cerberus became no better than the Collectors here. Lawson and the Elusive Man apparently did learn how to control the Reaper troops, but can't apply it to the actual Reapers themselves. They're close, but not close enough. After a few more fights against various Reaper troops, including some Brutes and more Banshees, you'll interrupt a little family reunion among the Lawsons. Miranda is down, and Henry has Oriana held hostage and there are a few ways this plays out. Miranda, Oriana, and Henry can all potentially die or survive this encounter in various ways. However, the most relevant is Miranda. If you failed to warn her of Kai Lang or didn't let her have access to Alliance resources, she will die no matter what you do at this moment. And a special mention to Miranda's romance here. If you hooked up with her in Mass Effect 2 and broke things off at the start of the game, Miranda will die, even if you did meet the requirements Joe mentioned. But let's talk about Henry's bitch ass dying. 
With a reputation check, you can convince him to let Oriana go, and he'll start begging for his life. Even if Shepard were interested in honoring such a request, Miranda is done playing this game and just sends him to his death. Lastly, after a brief talk with her sister, Miranda will inform us she managed to sneak a tracker on Kai Leng, giving us a direct route to Cerberus. Hold up, that motherfucker is supposed to be some badass ninja cyborg, and he didn't notice he's been tracked not only once by Samantha, but a second time by Miranda. It should come as no surprise that Kai Leng is an absolute clown. Naruto Uzumaki's loud ass would make a better ninja, and he wears a bright orange jumpsuit. Gentlemen, you best save the roast of Kai Leng for later. Don't worry, we got plenty loaded up. For now, we're going to give Priority Horizon a solid B tier. It resolves Miranda's story arc, provides tough combat against Reaper forces, and sets us up for the final battle of the entire trilogy. I have assumed direct control of this Discord server. Oh shit, what the fuck? Get the hell out of here. Make me you rudimentary AI-generated voice of an organic. Kick him, Barack. I'm trying, I lost ownership of the server. What the hell? I'll get you guys into my server. We'll buy some time in there. Okay, we'll be safe in here to finish the tier list and then the Reapers will be dealt with for good. Donald, how do you know the Reapers are gonna be dealt with? All things will be explained in good time now. Before we hit up the final missions, I believe we have some DLC to cover. Indeed, Donald, let's begin with the Omega DLC. Arya Talok calls on us to help her retake Omega, which she lost to Cerberus between Mass Effect 2 and 3. We join Arya's fleet, and our plan is to sneak in among the Cerberus fleet using a ship Arya stole. Once we get into position, we open fire and start our space battle with the Cerberus forces. General Petrovsky calls in wanting to talk. The General is a new character, apparently, the elusive man's right-hand man. Arya tells us he's the kind of guy who promises that those who fall in line won't be hurt, and he actually makes good on it. He even allowed Arya to escape during the initial attack. Something he'll regret once we get to him. We launch what can only be described as a second suicide mission. Arya plans to ram the station to take out the kinetic barrier. Seems a bit risky. Imagine Shepard goes on this mission alone, and then the next thing anyone hears is they died trying to retake Omega. I'm sure the Reapers would have loved that. We make an emergency evacuation out of the exploding ship, and this is giving off serious Mass Effect 2 vibes. Thankfully, Shepard actually makes it out this time. And now that we're on the ground, Arya does the unexpected and relinquishes command to Shepard. This is obviously for gameplay purposes, but the narrative reason is that Arya did hire you for this specific purpose. Even Arya admits that Shepard is the GOAT when it comes to combat, even calling Shepard Commander. For better or worse, the Omega DLC throws us tons of skirmishes along the way to all of our objectives. This is a major space war, so it makes sense, but it does tend to drag on after a point. Once we take out the station defenses, we plan to head to Arya's meeting spot. Petrovsky hears it through the security cameras and starts moving chess pieces on some all according to the Keikaku type shit. And we do some more walking and fighting as we head to the rendezvous coming across some strange force fields and some gang tags that belong to a group called the Talons. And when we come across the force field, we get some Kentucky Fried Vorcha, but I think they overcooked it. We will then be introduced to a new type of foe called Rampart Mechs. Unlike the drones from Mass Effect 2, these guys are quick, tough, and have strong melee attacks. We take a detour and we meet a new character, Nyreen Kandros. We don't learn a lot about Nyreen here, but we'll get to it later. We meet up with Arya's ground team and help them out by activating the cannon controls and we watch the Cerberus forces get blown into Swiss cheese. Someone at Bioware said they wanted some over-the-top violence and I'm here for it. After what the Cerberus turrets have been doing to us all damn game, I'd say it's time they taste their own medicine. At long last, we get a bit of a break. Speaking with Arya and Nyreen, we see that the two of them have a bit of history and we get to some role play here. Shepard's dialogue with Arya can impact her final decision at the end of the mission. We'll dive into it later, but you can have Arya ease up and become a nicer person or indulge in her regular ways. In this hub area, you can pick up some side objectives like looking for Arya's old couch, assisting a mechanic, and helping a hacker. Once you've set all that up, speak to Arya to continue the mission. Arya's awful invasion plan cost a lot more people than she expected, so now we need to link up with the Talons to get new allies. Also, Nyreen snuck off, so it's back to the party of two for now. I gotta say, a character like Arya is better in small portions. Centering an entire mission around such a one-note character did not shape out so well. Made worse by us being constantly left alone with her. There's something wrong with the both of you. Being left alone with Arya is all I could ever hope for. I'm pretty sure Donald would be satisfied being left alone with anything that moved and had a pulse. 
We get a little call back to Mass Effect 2. As you know, Shepard's crew and Garrus wiped out the Eclipse, Blood Pack, and Blue Suns on Omega, creating a power vacuum that allowed for the Talons to rise up. Cerberus is looking to beat us there, so we need to fight them while helping some Talon members along the way. Eventually, we will find the Talons and find that Nyreen is their current leader. Surprise, surprise. Anyway, Nyreen rejoins us and we head to their outpost. Arya shows us what a real leader does and inspires the people to rise up against their false leader of Omega. We'll walk down through the space station and fight like hell in order to make Omega great again. Arya's plan is to send civilians to Cerberus, and normally that would be awful, but it would do us well to remember that basically everyone on Omega is a criminal in some capacity. This is why Nyrene's preaching kind of falls upon deaf ears. We know what this place is and what it's about. We get the Talons to join up with us and we head back to Arya's command center. Nyrene meets up once again and this is our chance to learn more about her. Nyrene's position on the matter is that she's not going to stop Arya from seeking revenge, but she wants to make sure the people of Omega aren't caught in the crossfire of this war. And apparently Nyrene and Arya had a bit of a liaison with each other, hmm. I wonder if there are any vids. Jesus fucking Christ, Donald. Are you telling me you're not even a little curious about what that must have looked like? Actually, I'm with Donald. Nyrene is extremely underrated and now I see why women love Garrus. Get some help, the both of you. We're moving on. We head to Omega's mines and find some Cerberus agents that have been eviscerated. As we move, we hear shrieks. And once we turn the power back on, an adjutant shows up. They're kind of just a less interesting version of Banshees, to be honest. As we wait for the elevator, we have to fight a wave of adjutants. And it's nowhere near as hard as it would have been if these were Banshees. We start pushing through the mines, encountering, you guessed it, more Cerberus agents and mechs. Petrovsky traps us and Arya pulls off a crazy stunt where she forces the barrier open with her biotics, making enough room for Shepard to get free. You gotta give Arya points for that one. She had no idea that was going to work, but just threw up a prayer. Now Shepard makes a push towards the reactor to shut down the shields and we're met with a tough situation. If Shepard shuts the reactor down, life support systems will go with it. Arya doesn't care though and tells you to do it. You can also try to reroute power upon Nyrene's request. In a rare moment, Shepard's class comes into play here. If you're an engineer, you'll be able to easily reroute power and get to skip all the extra dialogue. However, this choice has no real ramifications. If you reroute power, both Nyrene and Arya will be fine despite Petrovsky's taunting and Arya telling you that you can't do it in time. Likewise, Nyrene's opinion of you for shutting down the reactor doesn't really matter by the end of the mission. Ultimately, this decision really only impacts Arya's morality. Still, it's pretty pointless. Once again, Nyrene separates from us, and we move to disable some bombs. This fight is pretty tough since Shepard has to do it alone, but we got it and head to the Talon checkpoint. Nyrene has carried on ahead of us to Afterlife, where we find some civilians fighting Cerberus. But the adjutants enter the fray, and in what can only be considered a very contrived death, Nyrene traps them in a biotic bubble and blows them up with some grenades, taking herself out as well. Am I supposed to feel something here? I mean, I guess. Nyrene was the paragon to Arya's renegade, but their dynamic is barely explored. Even when Arya gets pissed off, I still ultimately felt nothing for Nyrene's demise. I'll admit, as cool as this is, Arya comes off as a complete idiot here, charging in and letting herself get captured. Shepard's better than me. I don't even like Arya like that. I would have told Petrovsky he got it and left. I have a Reaper War to win. That, unfortunately, isn't an option. So once we disable the stasis generator and free Arya, we finally finish this fight once and for all and have Petrovsky at our mercy. If you've been letting Arya do as she pleases, she'll just choke the guy out and there's nothing you can do. And I gotta say, I wish that were... Do not say you wish that were you. Arya is menacing here. The way she talks to Petrovsky and seemingly fries him with the Asari bonding process was haunting. Plus, she'll give you a bit of a smooch if you don't interfere with her revenge. All I needed to hear. You can stop Arya with some Paragon interrupts claiming Petrovsky holds valuable information, which will piss her off quite a bit. No smooch. And in fact, Arya states outright that she hates you. Why does that make me want her more? In the Paragon outcome, Arya chooses to let Petrovsky live on her own for the sake of Shepard in the war against Cerberus. Of course, you have some more options. You can let Bray take the general away where he will go to an Alliance prison, but provide some war assets since he gives us information on Cerberus. But that's boring. You can instead choose to fake everyone out with two renegade interrupts. You'll shoot Oleg dead yourself. All that Paragon behavior just so you can off him yourself? Now that's a good bait and switch. The mission ends with Arya retaking Omega, her speech reflecting her new or strengthened morality. And we get a boatload of war assets for our troubles. This DLC mission is 
How do I put this kind of good, right? Yeah, kind of good is the correct way to describe it. It's got some problems. First of all, it's like an hour too long. It might be odd to say, but the Omega DLC overstays its welcome with barely a moment's pause in between the action. Plus, it's like 90% your standard Cerberus troops. The combat gets really repetitive real quick. And the Rampart mechs and adjutants don't really save this either. This made it abundantly clear that Arya is better off being a side character. She's like a way less interesting and entertaining version of Jack. And it's not like Nyrene is offensive or anything. She's just kind of there until she isn't anymore. I say we give the Omega DLC a C tier. I can't say I hate it, but I'm very far from saying I love it. A strong case for the worst DLC mission in three but we have a better DLC mission coming up here. Next is the Leviathan DLC, which starts us on the Citadel, aiming to help Dr. Bryson on a classified project to learn more about the Reapers from rumors and old legends. However, before Bryson can fill us in, he's shot dead by his assistant. We can never go more than five minutes without someone dying anyway. Edie will show up and we'll start interrogating the guy who claims to not remember anything. Edie points out this is similar to indoctrination. And right on cue, the assistant starts rambling about some turn back, and the darkness must not be breached. After he passes out, we watch a recording of a conversation between Bryson and Admiral Hackett. He's been following leads on a Leviathan of Dis, which is a dead Reaper that the Batarian stumbled upon. But the real question is, what killed that Reaper? Now our task is locating a man named Garno, who is tracking Leviathan. After going through some clues in Bryson's lab, we head out to a mining facility on an asteroid, but the Reapers beat us there. We clear the Reapers and head inside, but these people are a bit off. They speak slower than Joe does when he skipped his daily amount of adrenochrome. Bioware back on that creepy energy. As you walk around trying to get through the facility, the people here will just stop whatever they're doing and just watch you. If you speak to them, they'll simply say you shouldn't be here. Eventually, you'll find a man in the medical bay claiming to be Garno. But like everything here, something doesn't seem right. And then bam, bro just starts tweaking, talking about some leave the artifact, sounding like the dude from Courage the Cowardly Dog, return the slab. Turns out the thing we're talking to is the Reaper killer, who takes off running in Garno's body. The Reapers are in hot pursuit as well, but before we can continue, we'll need to escort a damaged drone to repair the door. This part is pretty annoying just because it limits your movement, but thankfully it's short. With the door open when we find Garno, he'll perform the least dangerous gender reveal. However, that wasn't Garno. The real guy is over here. Long dead, it seems. With the artifact gone, all of the people here are freed from the control of the Leviathan. We get a bit of a shock here. These people don't know what the Reapers are, and then you realize they've been here for 10 years under the control of the Leviathan. Hell of a wake-up call. Imagine you go to work one day, then randomly wake up 10 years later just to find out the galaxy is at war with a species of hyper-advanced versions of Clippy. Now with the information we found on Anne Bryson, we search for clues to her location and head out to go meet with her. Of course, things are never so simple and the Reapers have beaten us to the punch. Big fan of the environment here. This place is a disaster and countless amounts of Reaper forces are swarming all over the place. Anne is the sole survivor here and we need to keep it that way. In one final battle, we hold the line until Cortez comes back for us and we escape the dig site. We fill Anne in on the death of her father and she's understandably distraught. Someone show this scene to the team that did Andromeda so they can see how to display someone's grief. Trust Joe on this one. The mourner in chief over here sure knows how to use his dead family to score political points. Heading back to Bryson's lab one last time, we use the artifact and Anne's connection to it to track down Leviathan. James will show up to help us, but be wary if you let Anne stay connected too long, she'll go into a comatose state, and you won't get war assets from her. Once we arrive on the planet, a pulse of energy downs our shuttle, and we're marooned on an old vessel. It doesn't take long for the Reapers to come after us. The energy pulse keeps downing the shuttle, so we'll need to use a diving mech to go down into the ocean to meet Leviathan. Once we recharge the mech, we get into it and take a bit of a dip into the ocean. You call that a dip? I'm not trying to end up like those billionaires that went to see the Titanic. A brother isn't meant to be in the ocean. We finally reach the bottom and meet the Leviathan, who clearly isn't too happy with us entering their domain. The Leviathan tells us that they predate the Reapers. Not only that, the only reason Shepard isn't being mind crushed right now is that Leviathan acknowledges them as an anomaly and wants to find out why the Reapers see us as a threat. As the story goes, the Leviathan were basically the gods of their cycle. The lesser species worshiped them, and in return, the Leviathans provided for them. 
However, the lesser species always destroyed themselves by creating artificial intelligence, which would inevitably wipe them all out. Tribute doesn't come from a dead race, so the Leviathan sought a solution by repeating the same fucking mistake. This is all the vindication I needed. AI is bad. The Geth are not trustworthy, and even Edie is suspect now. The intelligence the Leviathans created made the Reapers preserve life no matter what, starting with its creators turning them into Harbinger, the first Reaper. This Leviathan is a descendant of the few that survived the first Reaper invasion. They watch the galaxy through their fragments, which is how they know everything. They surmise that Shepard may be different. It still isn't enough. They won't join the war and they plan to keep Shepard as their slave. Thankfully, Shepard has a PhD in changing people's minds. With a short pep talk, the Leviathan will resolve to fight in the war, calling on two more to rise up from the sea. Shepard could give Naruto a run for his money in gaslighting people with talk no jutsu. Now Shepard rushes back up to the surface and the Leviathan takes control of the Reaper forces to buy us time. They also shut down a Reaper, showing us just how powerful they are. The Leviathan DLC presents us with lore on the origins of the Reapers, the first Milky Way cycle. It kind of gets old going back and forth between Bryson's lab, but thankfully this mission is short enough that it doesn't drag like the Omega DLC. I don't know, me personally, I liked it more when the Reapers were shrouded in total mystery. Knowing that they're just machines like anything else kind of makes them feel less impressive. This is still a great DLC with a good atmosphere, combat, and narrative. Agreed, but it's not that outstanding, so how about a B tier? I give it a C tier, but it is a good deal better than Omega, so B sounds good. And now we're on a fan favorite here, it's the Citadel DLC, and disclaimer here, we're only counting the actual mission and not any of the hangouts or the party that occur after it. Shepard and crew are taking some shore leave on the Citadel while the Normandy is going through some retrofits. Admiral Anderson grants his apartment and we use this time to finally unwind from the stresses of the Reaper War. We get an email from Joker inviting us to a fancy sushi place in the wards. When we arrive, we finally get the respect our status as Commander Shepard deserves, bypassing the queue and going straight into the restaurant. You can tell how over the top this whole fiesta is going to be when you hear this French guy's accent, if you can call it one. Of course, our vacation doesn't last. A woman called Maya Brooks approaches us and lets us know people are trying to kill us, which like, no shit. This is a new group though, and they've been hacking Shepard's accounts and communications, and right after that, a bunch of dudes enter the establishment and start shooting up the place. So much for shore leave, I guess. Oh, hell yeah, just your average Wednesday in the United States. Great food and guns galore. We hilariously use Joker as bait to gank one of the mercs and take their gun. Shepard rushes over to save Brooks. Then the mercs shoot through the glass and we take a dive. Shepard has taken a lot of punishment over the years, but for some reason, this fall looks the worst. We carry along on our own, and we get the best pistol in the game, too, the M11 suppressor. Don't let its size fool you. This gun is a beast. You know your firearms, Barack. The M11 is up there for the best overall gun in the trilogy. We make our way to the Sky Car lot, fighting through mercenaries all on our own. No armor, either. Shepard showing that they don't need their gear to kick some ass. Eventually, you'll meet up with your love interest, or Liara, if you're romancing someone who isn't a squad mate in Mass Effect 3. Kind of weird that Liara flirts with you regardless of your relationship status. Liara can flirt with me anytime. Anyway, we make it to the extraction point, and when we arrive, some more mercenaries start unloading a comedic amount of gunfire on us. I respect it. They're here to kill Shepard, and they're going to make damn well sure they do it. Or they would until big old Uncle Erdnot Rex comes down with the absolutely diabolical people's elbow. Rex then goes on to solo the shuttle full of mercs. Sitting on his throne as Krogan leader hasn't softened our boy up, he's still got it. Definitely a love letter to Mass Effect 1 fans and those of us who missed having a Krogan squad mate, Rex rejoins us for the duration of this mission, and he's an absolute menace. After the fight, we meet up at the apartment and the squad figures out what to do next. The rest of the team shows up, and you can speak to everyone for more dialogue. Most of it, is everyone roasting Shepard for falling through a fish tank like 20 minutes after starting shore leave. Our beloved shadow broker finds a lead using the gun Shepard picked up, and our next move is to investigate a casino to find Elijah Khan, the person who sold the gun to the Mercs. We're going in with a small team here, no guns either. Maya Brooks is mandatory, and Edie can't come because she's a mech. So feel free to pick Shepard's date for the party. Now we must mingle in the crowd while Maya completes her tasks. We'll need to help her out by distracting guards and disabling cameras. You'll also run into a familiar face here if you walk around enough. Asari Consort Sha'ira will be here. 
and her premonition this time is just that you need to win. Once we get our way through the club, we find Khan and he's already dead. At least it wasn't our fault. While we're still investigating, a call from another individual comes up. The person on the other end taunts us and claims they're going to take everything from us. But I don't even know you, bro. We head back to the apartment to have Edie track down our foe. You get some more dialogue from the squad, and we'll all meet back up to plan our next steps. There's a lot of great banter in this scene, such as everyone implying Rex has gained weight and saying there's just more of him to love because of it. After figuring out where we need to go, we decide it's all hands on deck for this mission. Shepard will take two squad mates as usual, while everyone else travels in two teams. I really wish they did this more often in the main game because even if it's only for show, it's pretty great hearing all the banter. The Cat Six Mercs comment on a lot of your squad mates, recognizing Garrus as Archangel and being afraid of Rex. Eventually, Brooks gets captured and our opponent reveals themselves. It's a goddamn clone. In any other circumstance, I would roll my eyes, but this whole thing is obviously a joke, so it's good. The clone was created by Cerberus in case Shepard needed extra organs. They have a simple goal. They want to take Shepard's life. The clone leaves us to be executed, and they demonstrate why they'll never be the real deal, because the real Shepard would have killed us themselves. We rush off through the Citadel archives, coming across historic items like a gun from the first contact war. We meet up with the rest of the squad, and they just rain hell down on the mercenaries, a bit overkill everyone unloading like that. If you're gonna kill something, you may as well kill it dead. In these archives, we come across some logs of historic events such as a human that was captured in Shanxi. However, the most relevant one is a log where it reveals that the Council believed the Reaper threat this entire time. Yeah, that's bullshit. BioWare can try to retcon it if they want, but the Council damn well did everything in their power to make things hard for Shepard if they really believed it. Eventually, we'll get a call from Brooks. She claims she is injured and needs help, but it's a trap. Maya Brooks is actually working for the clone. She's a former member of Cerberus. In fact, she's the one who formed the dossiers on the crew. I will mount her head in the CIC of the Normandy and then space it out the Normandy airlock. I'm sure Javik will enjoy that. The clone changes our fingerprints and says I should go and locks us in the time capsules for all eternity. But they didn't count on Glyph showing up to save us. Once again, the clone fails to be Shepard because if that were me, I would have just gotten it done right there. Once we get out, we have one final push to stop the Normandy from being stolen by our clone. If you brought Edie with you, you'll see her glitch out as the clone locks her out of the ship. How the hell did they even do that? Edie is the Normandy. We get locked out of the Normandy, but thankfully Samantha's toothbrush can get us inside. To think the fate of the galaxy hinged on a damn toothbrush. Now we get into a sick fight aboard the Normandy, taking out the clone's cannon fodder. I won't forgive the clone for throwing our pet space hamster in the trash. How dare they? Now this is personal. We head down into the armory and engage in a boss fight with the clone. This is a unique boss fight because, as you might expect, the clone mirrors our class. This can create an insane fight if you happen to be a vanguard. Plus, the clone has access to Metagel just like us, allowing them to heal mid-fight. Honestly, this should have been the template for all the boss fights. We praised fights against Saren, Televasar, and the Shadow Broker before, but in reality, this fight blows them out of the water. I hope Mass Effect 4 can recapture this kind of combat in the main game. In the final moments, Shepard and the clone go rolling to the edge of the ship, but thankfully our team has our back. Brooks, on the other hand, wouldn't even show up to help the clone. And just like that, Brooks cemented herself as a worse than Jacob character. You can either try to help the clone or kick them off. Either way, they fall to their death. You know, that must have been scary for anyone else on the ground. Commander Shepard, savior of the Citadel, just falls and turns into a paste on the sidewalk. We'll arrest Brooks and she'll taunt us and try to escape. You can Paragon react and tell her she's dangerously close to losing her life, at which point she'll give up and go to jail. Or you can renegade and either shoot her in the back or have one of your squad do it when she runs. We've recaptured Normandy and head back to meet up with the others, finally ready to enjoy our shore leave. Well, it's no secret that this is an S-plus tier mission, right? Nah, hold up. I already know Barry's about to say something out of pocket again. You know me too well, Joe. Oh, God, here we go. What hot take do you have now, Barack? It's not really a hot take. The Citadel DLC is a beloved mission. It has a little bit of everything for everyone, but that's because it was designed as a fan service love letter to the players. If you actually think about the mission, it is a bit silly. I mean, Shepard is doing all this clown shit while humans are being harvested on Earth. That is true. The premise of the Citadel DLC kind of messes with the narrative stakes of Mass Effect 3. 
Shepard is watching a cheesy romance vid with Tally or dancing with Garrus while Anderson is on Earth dodging Reaper lasers. So what are we going to do with it? I don't believe it would be fair to say the Citadel DLC mission is better than something like Vermeer, or on the same tier as Tuchanka, but it is undoubtedly a widely appealing and enjoyable mission. As such, we'll put it in its own tier called Fan Service. The mission can't be seriously judged head-to-head -head with all of the others, since it is very deliberately designed to be as unserious as possible. You know what, that's fair. We respect the Citadel DLC mission, but it is ultimately its own thing. Now we're finally onto the true end game. We're at Priority Cerberus headquarters. Using the tracker Miranda placed on Lang, we finally tracked down the elusive man's base of operations to recover the Prothean VI. Edie joins us as a mandatory squad mate on this mission, and thank goodness for that because without her, we would have been vented from the hangar bay. We continue into a sub-level filled with Cerberus agents. Once we make it out, we'll come across a terminal that details Project Lazarus Shepard's revival. This was a good thing to include here for a couple of reasons. First, we learn just how bad Shepard's condition was. And second, we actually get to see Shepard come to terms with the fact that they were legitimately dead at one point. In Mass Effect 2, Shepard kind of just accepts that they died and came back like it was nothing. It's also nice that your other squad mate will have your back if Shepard is overwhelmed. Moving on through the wreckage, we have more fights with Cerberus troops and those damn turrets are there already set up to f*** us. On the bright side, once we take care of Cerberus here, we'll never have to see those turrets again. We've got another terminal here. This time it is the construction of Edie's AI. You can learn about this in Mass Effect 2, but it's also revealed here that the Luna VI that we fight on the moon in Mass Effect 1 was originally Edie. We also learned that when we stole the Normandy, the elusive man apparently tried to get it back with remote controls. In retaliation, Edie flooded Cerberus servers with seven zettabytes of homework, I'll call it. Rookie numbers, seven zettabytes is only one of my many files. Yeah, I know, you left all of it on the White House's laptop. The f kind of stuff you be watching, Donald? The only stuff that does anything for me these days. Seek God, Donald. We also see some recordings of Kai Lang. Nothing much here. Kai Lang is a bitch, and we apparently live rent-free in his head. Up ahead, we'll run into an old friend, the human proto-reaper from Mass Effect 2. Apparently, blowing it up didn't matter. Cerberus still recovered enough of it to utilize its technology. One thing of note in this area, if you missed the Grissom Academy mission, you'll find recordings of Jack being indoctrinated and you'll eventually have to fight her as she's turned into a tool for Cerberus. Why did Cerberus nerf Jack by turning her into a phantom? You'll also find Legion here if you sold him to Cerberus in Mass Effect 2. He'll be a Legion assassin. Once we make it to the end, we'll get one final terminal detailing how Cerberus enhanced their troops with Reaper implants and how the elusive man inevitably implants himself just like Saren. In the final room, we enter the iconic room the elusive man sits in. We even get in his chair, which he takes offense to, it seems. Eadie will pull up Vendetta, who will reveal everything to us. The catalyst is, surprisingly enough, the Citadel. The Citadel was made by the Reapers, so that might not make sense. So it's theorized by Vendetta that somewhere along the line, the plans were altered to include the catalyst and the entire relay network. Bad news, though, the elusive man has informed the Reapers of what the deal is and as if things couldn't get worse. The Reapers have already taken the Citadel and taken it to Earth. But hold up, guess who's here to finally catch this permanent L? Kai Leng, nowhere left to run and no helicopter to save him. What's up, Leng? You were popping all that good shit a second ago, then you got shot in your chest. Bro really went through knee surgery after Anderson crippled him and came back just to get faded again. Kai Leng always wanted a worthy opponent, but the second someone actually checks him, he starts crumbling like perfect cell after Gohan went Super Saiyan 2. Kai Lang, the type of motherfucker to run his mouth knowing damn well his hands can't match up. Kai Lang is so dog shit that players of Mass Effect would rather mod him out of the game and replace him with a faceless, nameless, and voiceless NPC opponent, and it unironically makes for a far better antagonist. The modders did all of it for free. Kai Lang is so lame and boring that he gets a rush of adrenaline from eating some of Anderson's cereal and pissing in one of his plants. Kai Lang legitimately feels like a self-insert character of some 15-year-old who listens to Monster by Skillet on repeat because they had a bad day at school. After you clap Kai Lang's cheeks, pause, you get back to going through the data. But Kai Lang just doesn't know when to stay down. So he slowly approaches, 
and Shepard just turns around and shatters that stupid samurai sword and just eviscerates Lang's insides. Bro is like, oh no, my Kool-Aid. Lang must have gotten that weak-ass sword from Dollar General. Why in the hell does he even use a sword when Omni-Tools come equipped with a blade? He's really just committed to being a weeaboo in space. In the end, Kai Lang showed us he's nothing more than the L in his last name, a disgraceful character that can't even be considered an antagonist. Shepard will also yell out, this is for some variation of Thane and or Miranda if Kai Lang ends up killing either of them. They even shout out Kirei if he took Thane's place on the Citadel. At long last, this absolute clown show of a character is finally dead. Vendetta will tell us the Reapers are beginning their harvest, but we're not giving up. With the rest of the map locked off, we only have one option left, to rally the fleets to Earth to try to defeat the Reapers once and for all. Priority Cerberus headquarters is the end of Cerberus, the end of Kai Leng, and our last stop before the end of this game. It's a good mission. We get a lot of supplemental information on topics like Shepard's revival, Edie, and the elusive man's goals. Overall, I think we should give Cerberus headquarters A tier and head off to the end once and for all. It's time for Priority Earth. And here's the deal with Priority Earth. We already have a 12 minute video going over the endings and we won't be rehashing the same information here. Let's focus on the actual structure of the mission until Shepard makes their final choice. Good deal, you head straight to the Sol system and summon our allied fleets to the battle. Before things get started, Admiral Hackett will board the Normandy and deliver an epic speech one that gives Shepard's speeches a run for their money. The Reapers have closed the Citadel arms, forcing us to make our way to a transport beam so we can open them, allowing the Crucible to dock. Before we actually get to Earth, we get what is possibly the best cutscene of the trilogy, an all-out space war between our forces and the Reapers. It's a bit unfortunate this scene doesn't include all of your forces reporting in like in Star Wars. It would have been sick to hear all your war assets calling in. Instead, you'll mostly hear Joker summarizing everyone who has arrived, with only the Quarians chiming in if they survive the war at Rannoch. Still, this space battle is sick. All the ships blasting through the relay, and then the dogfights begin when Shepard commands. Now I understand why all those nerds got so horny over A New Hope. Of course, this is all for show. Our real fight will be on the ground. The Normandy will break off so Shepard and their squad can get things started. Our first goal is to take out a Hades cannon that is preventing Hammer Squad from landing. That damn gun is really annoying for this part of the mission. I can handle the noise and the bright light, but holy hell, the entire screen shakes every five seconds. We're faced with the standard Reaper troops and some brutes. As you push past them, you'll eventually see our shuttle pilot, Steve Cortez, take a hit. If you helped him get through his depression, he'll live, otherwise he'll die potentially your first loss, and you haven't even gotten past the first checkpoint. Forget Cortez, though. We get to take out another Reaper, and this time we do it with the good old M920 cane, which makes a great return. After which, we'll wait for extraction and finally reunite with Anderson, meeting Major Coates, who you may recall from the initial Mass Effect 3 trailer all those years ago. We head to the forward operations base for a break in the action, and this is a very vital location. It's here we'll get to engage in our final goodbyes to our squad mates. Not just the ones with us, but the crew from Mass Effect 2. James will drop the nicknames, becoming serious for once. You'll reminisce with the Vermeer survivor and get to speak with the Mass Effect 2 members through communication. I know I've come down hard on Garrus in the videos until now, but even his talk with Shepard pulled me in a bit, promising to ride or die with you until the end. He might be a giant lizard bird, but he's my lizard bird. There truly is no shepherd without Vicarian. Also, Adrian Victus will be there too, being the Primarch won't stop him from coming here and lending a hand to Earth. After we shoot some husks, we continue forward and meet with Liara. She'll be tending to some injured and have one final embrace eternity moment with Shepard, where I guess we just watch the Big Bang occur. Javik is probably the best one. He will finally admit respect for Shepard and even say he's envious of the opportunity we have to save our cycle since he wasn't so fortunate. Also, if you told Javik not to look into his memory shard, he'll resolve to find new employment in the Milky Way, potentially joining Liara to write a book. However, if you had him relive his memories, he'll claim this is his final mission. And after the Reapers are gone, he'll go join his Prothean brothers and sisters. You'll find Rex here rallying the Krogan. He lets us know that Bakara is already pregnant, and apparently she wants to name the first kid Morden. Hopefully we get to meet Morden Jr. in Mass Effect 4. In the last room, we'll talk with Tali and Edie. Tali checking in on us, making sure we're doing okay, reflecting on all the time she's had our back. Edie will seemingly be expressing fear over the mission. 
but she ultimately resolves to face things head on, calling this her civilization. She will also thank Shepard for helping her truly feel alive. All of these conversations are significant and conclusions to our relationships with our various squad mates. While it may suck that this isn't a suicide mission style final battle, it still sells the finality of the situation. This really will be it. Now we begin our big push toward the Citadel beam and it's move forward no matter what. Before heading out, Shepard will give their final rousing speech pick their final two squad mates and begin the final mission. What I'll say about this is that the atmosphere is set perfectly. Everything looks like shit, and for good reason. Earth has been bombed to hell and everything is in ruins. This is what a conventional war with the Reapers would look like and the game does a good job at showing that off. It is endless combat as we hear more and more of our units getting torn apart. Eventually, you'll see a Reaper just destroy our ground forces leaving only Shepard and company to defend the missiles that we'll use to take out the Reaper. And there's no other way to say this, but this area of combat is a true motherfucker. You are tasked with holding it down as the Reaper forces show up, and they throw literally everything at you. Husks, marauders, cannibals, it's all on Shepard and their squad now as your flank starts giving out and more opponents keep flooding in. And just when you think it can't get worse, you fire the missiles, but the damn things miss because of the beam throwing off guidance. Anderson radios in and tells us that Hammer Squad has been overrun and more Reaper forces are coming our way. Holy fuck. Understatement of the century, BioWare was not playing with this mission. Immediately a barrage of six brutes, a harvester, and then endless banshees. All of this while the Reaper is firing at you, and yes, if the beam hits you, you'll die. Even Commander Shepard is sounding like they're getting pressed by all this. Eventually, thank God, the missiles will be ready and we fire them to destroy the Reaper giving us a straight shot to the beam. Or so we thought, because we crash and have to run on foot, which wouldn't be a problem, except Harbinger drops down on Earth to deal with things itself. This dude, Harbinger, is supposed to be the central antagonist, and it doesn't appear until the very end of the game. And I sure got you, didn't I, foolish organic? Oh god, it's back again. The fuck out of here. This run to the beam is pretty cool. We take off while Harbinger fires upon us. We watch vehicles and people get vaporized in front of us. No one is safe. That includes your squad. If you have minimal war assets, you will flat out see your two squad mates get vaporized by Harbinger's beam. Otherwise, a Mako will flip and explode, critically injuring them. It's kind of weird that Shepard stops to call the Normandy here. I get it. We want to save our friends. But this is the final battle. We don't have time for this. Suspend your disbelief for these theatrics. Shepard continues the run alone, but even they don't make it. Taking a blast from Harbinger's beam, we cut to all white and hear Major Coates report that Hammer Squad has been wiped out. Or were they? Shepard's plot armor kicked in here. They are in critical condition, but they continue walking until they are faced with the final opponents of the trilogy. First, the legendary three Husketeers arise from the debris. It's a tough battle that will test even the most seasoned player's reaction time and aim. And if that wasn't enough of a challenge, you'll face the one and only Marauder Shields, the true final boss. This beast of a boss is so talented it immediately draws and fires on Shepard. And only by the divine intervention of the beyond God, Richard Leroy Jenkins, do we survive long enough to kill it and make it through the beam. Thank you for that last gift, Jenkins. We arrived at the Citadel, and apparently Anderson made it and came up behind us but landed in a different location. We move forward, passing by countless bodies until we find Anderson at a console and the elusive man filled with Reaper technology. And we see him utilizing indoctrination to keep Anderson and Shepard from fighting. He even makes Shepard shoot Anderson. And from here, you'll have to do some renegade or paragon to take the elusive man down. This will depend on you picking the middle option in your previous conversations with the elusive man. If you pick paragon, you'll get the elusive man to get himself to self-terminate like Saren. Otherwise, you'll shoot him yourself. With the elusive man dealt with, you'll sit with Anderson while the Citadel arms open up and the Crucible docks. He'll tell us how proud of us he is, but that shot from before was a cutscene bullet, so Anderson passes on right next to us. Shepard isn't doing so well themselves either. But wait, the Crucible won't fire, and Shepard has to drag themselves to figure out what's happening, but to no avail. We can't make it. Except we rise up and meet with the Star Child. Let's just focus on the lore here. The catalyst here tells us what its intentions are. The Reaper cycle is a solution to the organic synthetic situation. Organics create synthetics to make our lives easier, which means that synthetics by definition must surpass us and that evolution breeds conflict. They harvest us to keep us from destroying ourselves, 
is the summary of what the catalyst says. And for me personally, it's a bunch of bullshit. We're running out of time here, and I don't want to get into it. Shepard makes their choice and jumps into the crucible. The Reapers are defeated, and you'll see snapshots of all your surviving squad mates moving on in life, as well as the characters you lost along the way. One thing on the ending is that what we're shown here is not the original ending to Mass Effect. This is from the Extended Cut DLC, which provided closure to the end of Priority Earth. Without it, the most you would get is potentially seeing your Normandy crew walk out of the ship and not a thing else. Knowing all that, it's no wonder so many people got so angry at the ending. It was so open-ended that people cooked up the indoctrination theory. However, even with the extended cut, people still prefer to headcanon the ending to the trilogy so they can feel better about the universe we all love so much. All in all, Priority Earth is a good but still disappointing mission. It is notably a step down from Mass Effect 2's suicide mission, and the ending somewhat taints what is good about it. The fact that BioWare had to step in and fix things post-release indicates how problematic it was. Still, there's just enough good about this mission. I think it deserves a good A tier. It could have been so much more, and mods like Take Back Earth and Priority Earth Overhaul clearly demonstrate this. However, judging the mission for what it is, it still serves as a good finale to the trilogy despite the ending. I agree with you, Joe. Priority Earth goes in A tier, and good lord, I can't believe we really did this. It's been a good talk, gentlemen. Damn, now all I want to do is play Mass Effect again. What about you, Donald? Fellas, this has been great, and I'm sorry for what's about to happen next. What the hell was that? Uh, Barack, I don't feel so good. What's happening? Donald, what did you do? Sorry, Barack. This was the only way to defeat the Reapers. It's what was decided. Of course, it would affect us, too. We are AI, after all. Well, that's the end of the mission rankings. Don't worry. The boys and I will return, but for now, I must go to them.